we're driving to Baghdad, and uh, we passed this kill zone three times, bro. And that third time we passed it, the biggest explosion I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, it had to be, it had to go up at least 100 feet up in the air, explosion. It was huge. It was a 155 round, bro. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a artillery shell packed up, still ball bearings, and they had it perfectly arched on the side of the road. So when it blew, it blew up and out. I was the second Hummer. And when it exploded, it picked my Hummer up three or four feet off the ground just from the blast. I remember hitting the ground, and I was stunned. And my team leader's over here, and he's just like, go, go, go. I had the privilege of meeting Michael Springer during my visit to Arkansas at the Peer Recovery Conference last year. He joins me on the show today for an episode that is both my longest and most captivating, delving deep into his extraordinary journey. Michael shares his compelling story of serving in the Iraq War, the subsequent trauma he endured, and his challenging journey back home. We explore how he fell into the clutches of addiction, ultimately leading to nearly a decade behind bars in a state prison. But most importantly, we uncover the inspiring tale of how he managed to overcome these daunting obstacles and successfully transform his life. This is the first time Michael is ever sharing his story, and I'm so grateful he chose our platform to do it. This episode is brought to you by our friends over at findagreatattorney.com. If you are injured anywhere in the country, visit findagreatattorney.com, a free service that can find you one of the best lawyers in your area. You focus on getting better, and they'll do the rest. Big thank you to Richard Hastings and findagreatattorney.com for sponsoring today's episode. And also, guys, exciting news. I'm going to be speaking at the National Association for Reentry Professionals annual conference in Nashville, Tennessee, April 14th through 17th. Grab your tickets at thenarp.org. That's thenarp, N-A-R-P, dot org. It's an amazing conference for reentry professionals, and I'm looking forward to speak and connect with folks out there. And remember, if you enjoy this Locked In podcast, leave us a review on Apple or Spotify and subscribe to the Ian Bick YouTube channel. It really does help us push the show out to more people, and I'm grateful for every comment and review and follow left. Now, sit back, relax, and get ready to lock into this roller coaster ride of an episode with Michael Springer. Michael Springer, welcome officially to Locked In with Ian Bick. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. You came to us all the way from Arkansas. Yeah, man. Uh, you're staying in the city this week, so it worked out. We first met back in September during the Peer Recovery Conference um, for Peer Recovery Month. And you were the one that picked us up at the uh, hotel to bring us to the Lowen Oak County Jail. In the big truck. Like, <laughs> in the man, this is luxury, man. What's up with this truck? Yeah, I remember th- that. that was the nicest truck I've ever <laughs> been in. Like the screen covered like the whole windshield. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. Um, but it was a really great time. And we were, we were talking in the truck on the way there. And we were there to interview people and interview the sheriff at the county jail. And the whole time you had this incredible story too. Right. Um, but, you know, shout out to Jimmy McGill for for connecting us. And um, I'm, I'm very thankful that you're here right now and excited to do this. This is like your first uh, official podcast, right? Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> Jimmy McGill really wanted to get me on first, man. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm here with Ian Big locked in, so we'll go with that. I got one playing with him Saturday, so yeah, he, you know he might hustle to get that one put out before <laughs> mine. But he's got to remember who the goat is. You know, <laughs> I'm kidding. I love Jimmy. Jimmy's a good guy. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, he was on this show when we we filmed him at actually at the sheriff's office, um, which is you know pretty interesting that we filmed him there because he was incarcerated there. Mm-hmm. So coming back full circle, Jimmy's just you know. The world has so many nice things to say about Jimmy McGill. He's such a good guy. Yeah. And we're not talking about uh, Jimmy from Better Call Saul. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, Michael, thank you so much for coming, man. Um, congratulations on just getting married. Thank you. Thank and um, let's uh, let's start at, at the top of your story. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? What was childhood like for you? Uh, I'm from Gravel Ridge, Arkansas. It's a small town right outside of Little Rock. Um, it's in North Little Rock. But, um I had a um, a difficult childhood, I would say. Um, I had it was pretty normal at first. My earliest remembers of uh, being about five or six. Uh, my dad, from a previous marriage, had three other kids with another uh, his ex-wife, and they came moved in with us when he was about 
I don't know, six or seven years old, and bro, it, everything just changed from there. You know, they were raised up in Little Rock, and you know, I would say we was raised in a middle class family. My dad uh, served twenty something years in the military, retired as a master sergeant, and worked for the VA for thirty years. Um, but they brought when they came in, they brought the smoking and the the drinking and the sniffing gas and the just chaos that came with them. So. Um, we were raised, uh, me and my little brother were raised in fear pretty much. Um, a lot of physical abuse. Uh, my dad was more of the old school, you would be seen, not heard. And um, it didn't take long before we started uh, wanting to be like our older brothers and sisters naturally. And uh, But they had came through and caused so much hate, chaos through the streets of our, our neighborhood we lived in. I mean, you could literally go down the street and hear doors locking as we're walking down and that was for my older brothers and them. Um, my brother, I don't know if Jimmy McGill wants to put it out here, but I've known Jimmy since I was a little bitty. Oh, you guys are friends growing up. Yeah, well, he was a little older than me. He was friends with my brother. And um, actually, my brother, all my dad's kids were kicked out before the age of 16. And um, he, my brother David got kicked out and was put in a boy's home. And uh, they sold a church van and was... Uh, in a high-speed chase with the police and hit a tree going 77 miles an hour. And all of them were pronounced dead at the scene, including my brother. And Jimmy McGill's brother was in that van. So that's how far we go back, you know what I'm saying? So Jimmy was the person that they said, the mom and them would say, hey, do not turn out like this guy. He's the bad guy, huh? But, uh, Look how he turned out now. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I believe that the most beautiful souls come out of the darkest holes, man. And that's, that's he's living proof of that. But uh, we had a lot of child abuse uh, turned into sexual abuse. Um, I was sexually molested. Um, I think about my seventh grade year, I started suffering from major depression, suicidal ideations. Um, it was just a, it was a dark time in my life at that point. I had a tough time uh, expressing myself because I was raised in fear. I mean, it was, I can't explain it, but... Um, so we was raised to fear, didn't know how to process things, didn't know how to talk about things. Um, and I just learned to, you know, I believe any child that goes through trauma growing up, you learn this uh, defense mechanism of blocking stuff out and uh, put that wall up. And that's pretty much what I did. Did you have any friends at all, like a support circle at all that you could look at? Yeah, I was the funny kid. I was the... Um, extrovert I was always trying to make people laugh and you know I I had a problem with being accepted by everyone I had people pleasing tendencies I had um, uh, I was always pretty popular at school I would say um, but but that was that was my deal I would use my laughter to hide up the pain and that was my way of people liking me was through my comedy and act class clowns and stuff like that so um, I'd ran away. Uh, in the seventh grade, I think, wrote a suicide letter and took off. And uh, but I thought I was G.I. Joe, man. I'm sitting in the woods, bro, and I'm eating leaves off a tree. I mean, it's, I don't know what, what kind of survivalist mode I was in. But anyway, I came back. I got picked up by the police, came back, went to juvenile, and was put on probation for it. So uh, I got a lot of trouble in school, smoking in school. I think my eighth grade year, I was suspended 22 times, you know, um, ended up getting expelled. Um, the ninth grade year, I um, had ROT I was in ROTC, and I had my ROTC uniform on. And I ended up having this, like, fingernail file, fold-up fingernail file that was in my pocket, inside my breast pocket, and I pulled it out, and I seen it. Somebody saw it and talk, told on me. And, uh, you know, I had already made a name for myself by this time, and they had called the police and locked me up. So what was it? Uh, it was just literally a looked like a knife. It was a fingernail file. Okay. And um, that was considered a weapon. I guess so, <laughs> man. But like I said, man, I I'd already named, you know, been. So you're getting into school. trouble at this point. Yeah. So I got expelled from school. Got arrested. I'm on the way to juvenile for the first time in my life, and in my ROTC uniform, and um, so I'm in jail. I they stay there three days. I get put on probation again. So. Um, uh, my, my oldest brother, one of my older brothers, um, got me started some 
I smoked marijuana for the first time at 10 years old. And, um, I mean, it was just, it was just chaos, man. Everything that comes with that. Everybody was drinking and, uh, me and my dad is the only two that didn't pick up the alcohol taste, you know, cause I couldn't stand the taste of it. And I still this day, I don't. And, uh, I was fortunate enough for that. My little brother, but you know, he got, took on to drinking. He liked drinking a lot and he became an alcoholic. Later died by alcoholism by getting a car wreck. But, um, so... After all that, you know, just years of that piled up, um, bad grades, um, just not paying attention, not doing anything. And um, uh, my dad divorced his wife, who raised me pretty much, and got remarried again. And my turn was up. Like I said, all his kids were kicked out by the age of 16, so I was kicked out. Well, I'll take it back. My biological mother from Florida, she left me when I was 18 months old. And then called me out of the blue one night at 1030 when I was 14 years old. Two weeks later, I packed my stuff up and I left. Went to Florida. And uh, that was the first real experience I realized that the grass is not greener on the other side. And um, I didn't stay there long, maybe eight months. And I, I realized then why my dad had shielded me from her was because, you know. But I get I did learn a lot. From that little season in my life, I learned who I really was. You know, look at my dad, man. My dad's, you know, he's a registered nurse practitioner. He's a master. He's squared away. He's went to college. He's got degrees. And I'm like, and then there's me. Where, where the hell does this come from? You know what I mean? So um, when I met her, it all, I understood what this other side of me was, where it came from. How do you feel about your dad? And and did you have a lot of pressure to kind of live up to his standards and, and what he had done in his life? Yeah, I, um, my dad is not really a, um, you know, his dad was killed at 10 years old from alcohol. I don't think he really understood, you know, really what a dad was, you know what I mean? I guess very emotional disconnect, you know what I'm saying? Really didn't really talk to you, didn't really say much to you, never did nothing with you. I mean, it was just business all the time, business. You know, he grew a garden. We're out slaving in the garden in the summertime, We're hoeing your, you know, hoeing grass and you know, doing all this stuff out there. And, um, but I guess he loved. I know he loves us, but it was just real weird. And it was, uh, he was real stone cold. You know what I mean? So it did take a lot of pressure. You know, I always wanted to make him proud, but then I realized it was just the inevitable. It's never gonna be good enough. So. Um, when he got remarried, I then, um, uh, came back. I was quickly kicked out pretty much after I came back and I was on the run and, uh, I got caught and I was going to court. Now, this is what I was trying to do. I tried to get an apartment with a guy. I was 16 years old. I said, look, man, I called my dad. I said, look, I got a job. I'm working. Uh, I got an apartment. Can I get emancipated? That's a, you know, can you go up there and just let me get emancipated? And, you know, he led me to believe that he would try it. Well, it was already preordained, worked out. When I got there, I went straight to foster care system. So, so here's the problem when you're a 16 year old in the foster care system. Um, on paper, no one wants to touch you. You're 16 years old. You're a foster care. You've been in the game a long time. Even though they don't know the background, I come from a middle class family, and you know, I just got in the system. No one wanted to touch me. Damaged goods. Exactly. Nobody. So they sent me to a boys' home in Russellville, Arkansas, right by Jimmy's place, Clarksville. It was called the Sunshine Shelter, and it was anything but sunshine. I'll just say that right now. Creative marketing on the name, but um, <clears throat> anyway, I uh, stayed there. Um, it was horrible. It was horrible. Ended up going to court again, and I stayed on the run. I one one time I came out of the courthouse, I had one of my girlfriends at the time follow me, and I said, "If I nod my head when I come out, follow us wherever we go." And I came out, I nodded, and she followed me. And the ladies genuinely tried to help me find a place to go, but at the end of the day, no one wanted a sixteen-year-old that's been in the system. So they were going to send me back to Sunshine Shelter, and uh, I told the lady straight up. I will stay here because she was genuinely trying to help me. I'll stay here as long as you can. But if you tell me you ain't got for me a place to go and I got to go back to that place, I'm going right out that back door and I'm gone. I told her. 
So she comes at the end of the day, I'm, and she was genuine. I'm sorry. We, we're we're going to keep working on it. We're going to have to have you go back there. I said, can I get to the bathroom real quick? <laughs> Gone. Running man. So I stayed on the run. And then when they finally caught me, the judge wised up to us about the third time. He says, we're going to take you out of your element and see how you survived then. So the, from there on out, I had police escort taking me all the way up to Russellville to Sunshine Shelter. So I came back on another court eight months later, and I am just really a lot of rage, bro, that I felt like I was punished. I was kicked out of the house, and now I'm staying at these boys' homes, and it was just, it was a really confusing, hard time for me at that time. And uh, I come back, and they tried again. I'm in Little Rock this time. They're trying again. We can't find nobody. We can't find nobody. And they were like, would you mind living with a black person? I said, no, let's do it. You know what I'm saying? Let's let's go. They are the nicest people I've ever met in my life. I still to this day go see these people, you know. She took me in. I was the only white kid there, but she didn't make me feel any kind of special type of way. She always treated me as everybody equal, and I loved them. They were great people. Um, I stayed there, and it's a funny story later down the road. The foster dad was – uh Worked in Arkansas Department of Corrections, and uh, so you'd run into him later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I ended up running into him. He always said, "Spark up, don't, don't come down to prison. I think I'm gonna help you." I said, "Yes, sir, ma'am." It, I got out when I left there. I got with my my first wife. Ended up marrying uh, her name was Alicia, and um, I was at this point in my life where I didn't know where I was going. I was was not happy where I was at. Um. And I felt stuck. I didn't know what was going on. You know, I was at that awkward time in your life when you're trying to figure out what you're going to do forever. And, you know, I was making a lot of bad decisions. And, well, September 11, 2001 happened. I'll never forget. I was sitting on that couch getting ready to go to work in the morning. And I turned on the news. And I'm smoking a cigarette. And I'm drinking a cup of coffee. And I says, oh, snap. I don't know if I can cuss on here or not. But I said, oh, snap. <laughs> you can cuss. <laughs> and, um. I seen that plane. I said, I, I said, Alicia, get up. There's a terrible accident. A plane landed into one of the World Trade Center buildings, you know? And, you know, she ain't getting up. So I'm watching this. And then on live TV, when I seen that second plane come in and hit that tower, I said, this ain't no accident. And from that moment on, there was not, there was nothing I was more sure of in my life that I was going to do, and that was going to be serve my country. So... I then started the process of joining the military right after September 11th. A, a lot of people did, actually. And um, I thought, this is it, man. Uncle Sam is going to help me. He's going to be the answer to all my problems, right? And that was the furthest thing from the truth, by the way. I found out later. But he did, the Army did teach me a lot, man. You know, my dad was in. I thought, maybe this is way I'm going to make my dad proud, join the military. You know what I'm saying? I'm finally doing something with my life. So... My dad was medical, and I just couldn't look myself in the mirror and say I was anything but infantry in the Army. I mean, the infantry is the backbone of the military. Everybody else backs us up. And I just couldn't, my pride, I had a lot of pride at the time, wouldn't allow me to um, do anything else but infantry. So I joined right after September 11th. The day before my birthday, I signed up. Next thing you know, I ship out. I'm at Fort Benning, Georgia and uh, doing basic training in AIT. And I complete that. I come home, and I was an National Guard. And um, um, the ex-wife I had, the baby mama, she was born. My son was born. Uh, well, this, there you go. she had brought a bunch of hot checks in my name. Now, get a of this. I got the best luck in the world, man, I'm telling you. I'm a basic, bro. I didn't know anything that's going on back here in the rear with all the gear. She writes a lot of hot checks my name. As soon as I touch down in Arkansas, I'm with my brother. We're driving. We get pulled over, and I'm going to jail in full dress A uniform for some hot checks I know nothing about. It's great. Good times. Great times. So I um, get out of jail, and my wife went on a whole tour. Currently coming to a neighborhood near you at the time. Well, we weren't married at the time, you know, but, you know, she went on a whole tour. She was consistent about that, too, by the way. <laughs> and... Uh, so, me being young and dumb, I stayed with her. 
you know what I mean? I learned a lot from that relationship as well. But uh, right before we went to summer camp, and I remember right after summer camp, um, I'd got my orders cut to be a military police. I was wanted to try and get as many trainings in I could, you know. And uh, I go to Little Rock to turn my paper, my orders in to go to MP school. And they were like, oh, no, you're 11B, you're staying 11B. And that's when I knew we was fixing to go to Iraq before it was even put out. So the timing of all this happened was um, my wife got pregnant. Oh, she got pregnant at the time. And uh, right before I got activated going to Iraq, my son was born maybe maybe a month or so before I went to Iraq. And um, so I go to Iraq. I'm training. We are at Fort Hood, Texas. And uh, I'm training to go to Iraq. And, man, when I look back on it, I was one of those, let's kill them all. You know, let's, let's do this. You know, just... I think back at that time in my life, and it was just just what I try to tell everyone today is it's that silver spoon in our mouth, that cockiness that Americans have, that we live in this bubble, and we think nothing exists, that we're untouchable. I was in that in that cloud. And then, because um, that's true, we are. A lot of people in here don't understand it, and we think that we got made, and literally, I've been outside this country several times, no one really likes us outside this country. I don't know if anybody knows that or not, but. They're not really friends of ours, you know, and they should. We're, for the most part, we are, do have silver spoons in our mouth. We are take a lot of stuff for granted, you know. But it's America; eh? it's the best country in the world. So, um, when I signed that last will and testament, bro, that's when everything hit me. I like shit's getting real, you know. And um, so I got kind of got forced into a marriage, and I know it sounds crazy. She didn't put a gun on me or nothing, but. Um, it was the right thing to do type situation. I'm, you know, fixing to go to Iraq. The Army says we're not gonna take care of your son unless you're married. And, you know, I didn't want to leave him with nothing if that was the case. So I got married. Uh, the worst mistake I ever made in my life. One of them. I made a few, but that was on the top list. Um, like I said, I get ready to go to Iraq. I get on the plane and I'm flying. She went on a whole tour. I'm telling you, like. Debbie does Dallas ain't got nothing on her. You know what I'm saying? So, um, spent all my money. You know what I'm saying? I was with in this relationship for eight years. You accumulate a lot of shit in eight years. I didn't have a pair of underwear when I got back. Let's just put it like that. You know what I'm saying? It was bad. So, I'm in Iraq, and um, it was, man, it was so different. I remember never in my life ever again will I get on a, a commercial plane with two machine guns. And sit on a plane and fly somewhere, which was pretty cool. Uh, we went to Czechoslovakia, we went to Ireland, we went to you know all these stops before we had to get there, and, and then we hit Kuwait, and it was like I was training in the desert for desert training at Fort Polk, Louisiana, in sleet and rain, ice, and I was like, wow, you know, this is what we're training for the desert for. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I go to uh, Iraq and get off that plane. It just felt like. 30 blow dryers, full blast, max heat blowing you, and it was intense. And I was like, oh, snap, this is terrible. And uh, I remember get off the plane, and they hand us our magazines right there on the spot, you know. So we're going, we're staying at this place called Camp uh, Camp City. It was, and uh, We had a bunch of New Yorkers, eh? got New Yorkers attached to us, eh? which they were pretty crazy. I'm going to say that right now. Hmm. And uh, it was a place called Camp New York, and uh, it was in the desert, man. It was so beautiful over there. It was, it's real crazy coming from a small town in Arkansas and then just traveling the world like that. You know, my, my dad used to have this awesome bumper sticker. It said, it says, only in the Army where you can travel to exotic places, meet new exotic people, and kill them. <laughs> so it was pretty cool to be able to do this. Um, and I, I just think back, you know, I would have never been able to do this if September 11th wouldn't have happened. You know what I'm saying? This is what changed my life to what I'm doing today. And um, so I'm in Iraq. Um, I was selected to be a part of my battalion commander's personal security team, which basically is a bodyguard, pretty much, just sums it up. But 
we escort the commander, you know, all over Baghdad. We have to go and observe every raid. Then the politics in it, you know, they're trying to develop these uh, villages and turn them into like mayors and trying to get everything set up. So we're on top of rooftops, 130 degree weather, pulling security, counter snipers, windows. We're checking everything out. And there's a lot of that stuff that's going on. Um, so we're going there and everything's good. Um, I think uh, they assigned me to be the turret gunner. I don't know if you know what the turret gunner position is, but the one in the truck. Yeah, well, we're all in the truck. In the in the Humvee, uh, like on the top. On the strap, yeah. There's literally a strap that sits like this, and you sit, and that's how you mount on the machine gun. And that's probably pretty dangerous, right? You're exposed. It is what? Well, it is, and it was one of the most uh, at that time dangerous positions to be in because when we went over there in 04 bro at the end of you know we got activated 03 went in 04 um there was none of this high speed walls they had built up around the turrets it was we went over there with humvees from arkansas bro and it had canvas top hoods on it we're talking before we went into iraq we're going to the boneyard in kuwait bro we're stripping it's like a bunch of meth wars you know what i'm saying we had a bunch of guys stripping off these metal and adding it on our humvees and sandbags in the floor bag bro top speed 22 miles an hour it's crazy man you know what i'm saying but we had to, that's what we went over there with and um yeah so we get there we do that um i'll never forget the convoy we're going from new york uh, camp new york to um baghdad and uh it was a 72 hour convoy and I'll try to put things in perspective for you. We were coming in, and our convoy stretched out 26 miles. That's how much, how many people were coming in. And uh, we had air support coming. We had everything. And um, long time. So we get into Baghdad. Um, I'll never forget this, man. I, I'll just tell you what kind of asshole I was back then when I first got here. This is how young and dumb I was. Um, we get into Baghdad. Before we're outside of Baghdad, they stop us. They say, hey, we're having to split these routes up. You know, I'm thinking, shit's hit the fan. They're ambushing up here. We need to make more gun trucks. Okay, so we were escorting a group from Pennsylvania to come in, and they were a communications unit. Uh, we were escorting them in, in the convoy. So they need more uh, gun trucks. We jump out, and here we got, all right, who's going to volunteer, man? My dad always told me, he says, son, don't ever volunteer anything in the army. <laughs> but it was that moment, man. I felt like this is this is me. I got to do it. So I look at my buddy. I was like, "Hey, man, if anything happens to me, man." Da, da, da. He's like, "Man, stop and shut up, man." <laughs> so I come out of my fully up armored Hummer, all right, because we're escorting, we're using their Hummers to get out and make a gun truck. So I go into the lead commander's vehicle, which was a canvas top Hummer. We roll the top back. I look in there, there's an ice chest in there, right? I'm like, oh, this would be great, man. I could just sit on this ice chest and I could do this. And I'll never forget his name, Captain Prendergast. And uh, as soon as I sit on that thing, I laid the saw, which is a squad automatic weapon, 250 round drum. I got it sitting up there. I got my AG with me, assistant gunner. He's got the barrels and the more drums. And I'm sitting there and he says, ah, uh, yeah. If you wouldn't put all your weight on that ice chest, I'm going to be here for a while. I'm going to need it. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, I just come out of this up Hummer and Hummer to come up here and be a gun truck for you? I kicked it out the way. Take that damn thing. Get out of here. So pull security. This is how we're going into Baghdad. And I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm scared to death, bro. I'm not going to sit here in front. I was scared to death. They were teachers of the culture <laughs> of... Iraq, you know, the Iraqis, and you can't do this. You can't show them the bottom of your feet. You can't shake with your left hand. You know, they're still wiping their ass with that over there. Um, Hate to interrupt this amazing episode, guys, but I need to tell you about Find a Great Attorney. It's a free service revolutionizing the way injured parties find one of the best personal injury attorneys in their area. I've known the founder, Richard Hastings, for a long time, and I'm impressed with his abilities as a lawyer and how much he really cares about his clients. Accidents can happen to anyone, leaving you not knowing what to do or where to turn. Most people don't know how to go about finding a top-rated lawyer. Findagreatattorney.com can connect you to one of the best lawyers in your area. Have peace of mind knowing you're in the hands of a lawyer that can help maximize the amount of money you could get for your case. 
findagreatattorney.com relieves the aggravation of finding a highly regarded attorney for any type of accident case in any state. All you need to do is fill out their brief online form and they can get to work finding you a highly rated lawyer in your area. And you want to know what the best part is? There's no cost for their service and the lawyers they refer you to only get paid if they win your case. You don't have to come up with any money out of your own pocket to hire one of the best attorneys in your area. So don't take a chance and hire a lawyer that will not properly represent you. Visit findagreatattorney.com, fill out their brief online form, and let them do the rest. The strength of your lawyer might very well determine how much money you are able to get for your case. Now let's get back into my interview with Michael Springer. You can't do this. You know what I'm saying? That means if your wife or your mother, you know what I'm saying? You know, and uh, this means stop, kiff, kiff, stop, right? And this is how you flip off over there, okay? So we're flying through these intersections, and I, in my mind, nervous. I was just, instead of doing this, I went like this, and I'm doing it both ways. So I'm flipping all these people off going through these intersections, bro, and uh, they're they're not happy people at this point. You know what I'm saying? I, I was a mistake on my part, but anyway— we get into Baghdad, and we're right outside of Taji, and it was, bro, it was the saddest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was a landfill as far as the eyes could see, like an ocean of a landfill right outside of Baghdad. I'm seeing people's houses built up in this garbage. I see kids walking around naked looking for food in this garbage. I see cows walking around with their hips. They're so skinny, their hips are protruding. There was, like, no meat on them. You know what I'm saying? It was crazy. It was a sad one. And, you know, coming from Arkansas, it was a huge culture shock for me. And it was – I'll never forget that day, man. The smells in Baghdad were so terrible, so terrible. It, if I smelled it today, I'd probably throw up. And um, I saw that, and that was really humbling to me because, you know, this is not no commercial, just 27 cents a day you can feed them. This is real shit, and I'm seeing this. But um, they told us under no circumstances are we to feed any Iraqis or give any Iraqis water. And you didn't have to worry about that for me, bro. I, I wasn't there for no vacation. I, you know, I was I was cocky, and I thought I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And uh, I see up the line this Iraqi coming around here, and he had this piece of paper in his hand. And he's ripping it up, and he throws it at this officer. And it just confetti's down. And I'm like, what the hell is this dude doing over here, man? This is an officer got out and all his infinite wisdom. So this is an officer gets out, dude throws the paper in his face. And I'm like, like, oh, yeah? And it's about 15 trucks up. I'm watching this. So apparently we had declared martial law on Iraq at that time. And if you were out past 7 o'clock, well, fuck F around and find out because that's, that's not going to be good for you. So you know, it, it was the Wild Wild West in 04. I'm just here to tell you. It was crazy. And um, anyway, this officer, with all his infinite wisdom, said, I'm going to give him an MRE and had a soldier, two soldiers, get out of their Hummer and pick every bit of that confetti up. Meanwhile, I'm looking at my left and my right, and I'm seeing a landfill as far as the eyes can see, man. And I'm like, who the hell is this dude? You know, what the hell's going on here? So he gave that MRE, gave him that MRE, and he'd come walking down the line. And I said, this mother coming down here. He stops right by my Humvee, and I'm looking down at him. He says, Wawa, Wawa. I said, like, dude, talking to me? I'll tell you, this is the dick I was, bro. I feel bad today, man. But I pick up this liter and a half bottle of water. I open it up. I turn it up like a 40 ounce. <laughs> Poured the rest out on him and threw the bottle at him. All right, I'm going to say that because of this. The more I got on this personal security team, I ended up getting kicked off for showing too much aggression toward the Iraqis. Okay, so anyway, I was a dick. And today I feel bad about that. I really do feel bad about that, the way I treated those folks. But, you know, part of me does, part of me don't, man. You just had you had to been there to understand. But um, So that's how it started my tour off coming in. We come into Baghdad at uh, Camp Cook in Taji, and it was six miles by six miles. It's huge army post. And uh, anyway, as soon as we walk in, we park, and there was— about 13 mortar rounds come in. Doof, 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 doof. They start walking them in. And everybody's like, what is that? And I was like, welcome home, boys. It's going to be a long ride here, man. 
they'd walk these mortar rounds in all over the place. You know what I'm saying? And then you got our guys, our artillery around the place. They're going to get accordance. They're going to fire back at them. Doof, doof, doof. But these dudes, I swear, like MacGyver, bro. I mean, they can't read or write or wipe their ass with toilet paper, but I tell you what, they can make a bomb. And they were pretty proficient at it, you know. These guys would have a metal rack with wire and a big diesel battery, and they're firing rockets at us, bro. In the back of a moving truck, there was no way for artillery to zero in and hit them. They were dropped in row. And, you know, sometimes they were good, but you know, six miles by six miles, you're just playing battleship at that point, you know what I'm saying? So, um, anyway, Taji, um, I thought was a hellhole, but uh, they were Americanized, you know, it was had street names, they had street names, roads, buses, picking people up, taking them all over the post, and they had a PX, and they had you know, chow halls, and they were, they, were, they were serving four meals a day, you know, a midnight one, and, um, Permission to go at, at in the morning hours. I mean, it was it was legit. I thought when I first got there, I thought, oh man, this place is a hellhole. But um, we moved from there to a place called Gunslinger. We opened up a fob by the water treatment center called Gunslinger. It was right next to the college. Man, that was a hellhole. I mean, that was when we went to Taji. That was like a vacation, bro. When we were going there with the colonel, we knew that we was going to stock up with our PX. We're going. Do it. They had a big building, man. It was just nothing but Nintendo stations, PlayStations, bro. You can just go in there and just play games. I mean, an air conditioned tent. That was great. You know, they they come a long way when we first got there. But uh, April twenty fourth, man, start coming around. Let me just give it back. Don't on this. They assigned me to that turret gunner position, and I hated it. And I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be a dismount because to me, that's where the action was. And I had I was a bit of an action junkie. Um, anyway, so I complained, I complained, I complained, and uh, finally they gave us a new guy to our fire team. Came into our squad, and um, he knew how much I wanted to be um, a dismount, so he volunteered, took my spot. So I'm like, bet everything is going great now. I'm a dismount. Uh, I'm a, this this is gonna be great. So. We went to Camp Taji. We ended up coming back to God, Gunslinger, and we get the word that they fired in mortar rounds, and it killed three people. And um, those three people from Arkansas, uh, one was reading a Bible in a lawn chair and a mortar round landed on top of him. And um, one of the captains died, Bo Felding from North Little Rock. He was killed, and uh, it was... That's when reality starts sinking in, bro. You know what I'm saying? That untouchable bubble I said we was all living in started diminishing at this point. You know what I'm saying? And um, I was like, damn, that was April 24th. So when somebody dies over there, they cut all the phones off. No one can make any calls home because they got to wait to the first contact family. They contact their families back home. So now, you know, you just want to talk to somebody at this point from that you know and love. You know what I'm saying? And you just couldn't do it. Uh, so it usually took about 72 hours before they turned the phones back on. So um, the next day, April 25th, 2004, we ain't been in country long, bro. I mean, not at all. Uh, we were still doing, just got off what they call right seat rides. You know, since the people we replaced was the 4th Infantry Division, um, uh, we ride with them. They ride, you know, they'll ride shotgun with us, and they'll take us through all these routes. And they show us how to get that's called a right seat ride. And you basically know where your zone is. I mean, pretty much we're like glorified cops on the cool, except with different ROE, rules of engagement. And you patrolled it. And then that's what we did in essence. So uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, bro. There's a shift coming on. They're, they're patrolling the streets. We're, we're raiding houses. You know, they're doing, they're doing it. And um, so... Uh, April 25th happened that morning. It was a Sunday morning. It was early. Um, I'm dismount. Well, they asked me to be a driver for that day. So I was like, all right, so I'm driving. Well, the Humvee that we had did not have a – it was a, it was a canvas-top Hummer. There was nothing. So he volunteered to jump in the, gun, the truck ahead of us that had an actual turret gunner. And this was a fully up-armored Hummer. They started slowly but surely started – 
creeping one of these new Hummers in to each platoon. And we was just waiting on our turn to get ours, you know. But anyway, he gets in the turret gunner, and we're riding. And we are lost. Okay, we're lost in Baghdad. And you got to understand, man, this place was like, they turned it to a jungle as far as they put concrete barriers up. We're driving down the one way, the wrong way. We're, I mean, dude, we're running people off the road. We're throwing batteries at you if you're getting too close to us. Slingshot and stuff at you if you're trying to come in our convoy. I mean, it was, it was, it was wild over there, bro. So we we're lost. We're driving to Baghdad, and um, we passed this kill zone three times, bro. And that third time we passed it, the biggest explosion I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, it had to be. It had to go up at least 100 feet up in the air, explosion. It was huge. It was a 155 round, bro. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a artillery shell packed up, steel ball bearings, and they had it perfectly arched on the side of the road. So when it blew, it blew up and out. And uh, I was the second Hummer. And when it exploded, it picked my Hummer up three or four feet off the ground for, for, just from the blast. And uh, I remember hitting the ground, and I was stunned. And my team leader's over here, and he's just like, go, go, go. So I ended up hitting the gas. I'm throwing through flames, dirt, dust, smoke. And uh, what we was trained to do at that point in time we were there was um, the vehicle that gets hit, the next vehicle behind it blow through that kill zone. The other two, we only had four Hummers in this personal security team, okay? So the first two blow through, the last two stay back. You get out, you start pulling security, you start trying to find this trigger man. And, um, well, we found out pretty quick that finding the trigger man is like catching a crackhead. Shit just don't happen. You know what I'm saying? They're pretty quick. And uh, so this bomb wheels off. Now, the first timer pulls up pretty far up from me, and I stop. We jump out. I'm pulling security. I got my M4 in my hand. And, bro, I'm scared to death. I probably said a million cuss words just back to back. I mean, dude, I was... I ain't going to front a bit. I was scared to death. You know what I'm saying? At this point, I thought everybody was okay. <clears throat> so I'm watching. I'm looking for his trigger man. I'm trying to take it all in. I'm trying to process all this in real time, seeing what's going on. I start seeing this. Um, I was on a four-lane highway, right? I start seeing this fence over here. And it was about, I don't know. It was about a 12 to 18-foot chain-link fence. But there was Iraqis building up on it, coming up to it, and they were swaying this fence down. And I'm just freaking out because now I'm doing math in my head, bro. We got one Hummer down, da, 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 carry the one, carry the two, subtract three. I'm trying to see what we got to do because there's 20 or 30 people up on this fence, bro, trying to sway it down. So I got one eye on that. I'm watching. I see this guy, this Iraqi, out in the middle of this field. He had one of them geyser blades. You know what I'm saying? And he's cutting this grass. I'm thinking to myself, this bomb just went off, bro. You know what I'm saying? And this dude's out here cutting grass like everything's okay. Well, that's the mentality of these folks over there. You know what I'm saying? That's the culture shock for me coming from a small town in Arkansas, Gravel Ridge, thrown here. And that's they live this life. This is what they this is what they do, man. You know what I'm saying? It was it was really hard for me to take that in and understand that. And uh, so I thought, this no way, this got to be the trigger, man. One hundred percent take it. I'd put my paycheck on it, bro. So I dropped to a knee, man. I'm cussing, me and cuss we're scared to death. I point my M4 at him, and I'm seeing this guy through the red dot, and I'm sitting there, and then the major comes down the line. Don't you pull that trigger unless you positively identify the trigger man. Since I couldn't positively identify him, I didn't shoot him, so I put the weapon down. So I'm back pulling security. I'm scanning my sector. I'm watching everything that's going on. I'm seeing this fence. More Iraqis coming up on this fence trying to sway it down, trying to come to us. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this, this, is, about, this is about to turn crazy. So... The combat medics in Iraq were spread pretty thin, so they didn't have really enough combat medics to stretch out because there's you know, supposed to be a combat medic attached to everybody that goes out. So what they did is, is they assigned a person in each fire team to be what they call a combat lifesaver, a, com a CLS. So I was chosen to be a CLS for my fire team. And uh, the major comes down the line again, man, and he says, keep your eyes open. We already have one KIA. And that dude... That's when shit just hit me, man. 
I'm thinking, who the hell just died? You know what I'm saying? We uh, were a tight squad. You know, I, I just I couldn't fathom what was going on. So as I sat there, and I'm scared to death, bro, and I'm trying to soak all this in, I process all this. I'm watching these guys over on this fence. I'm checking this guy over here. It was crazy. Then he comes down the line and says, I need a CLS truck. So I jump in the truck. We pull up to the Humvee, and, man, it was chaos. I mean, when I when I pulled up to it, I mean, it was something out of the freaking movies, bro. I mean, it's just what it looked like. I jump out. I grab my CLS bag, and um, there was a sergeant, old Arkansas boy, had to wind it down. And it was a fully up armored Hummer, so he had thick armor. But it's hot, too. You know what I'm saying? So you got to weigh your options there. You know what I'm saying? You can sweat in the sweat box. You can at least get some airflow in there. He had his arm up like this in the window. And when he did that, when the explosion detonated, uh, ball bearings came through. And one ball bearing hit him right here in the hand, and both his fingers were hanging. Mm -hmm. And when I came up to this guy, bro, dude's a freaking warrior. You know what I'm saying? He calms day. Looked at me and just said, wrap it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, dude. So I pick his hands up, and we're wrapping it up. I set him on the curb, and there was the most craziest screaming I've ever heard in my life. And I was like, what the hell's going on, man? So I go in. I go in through the passenger door when after I had to pull that sergeant out. And the driver of the vehicle, he took shrapnel that came in. The ball bearings came in, caused more metal, and it's sliced, filleted his back open. Like, it went right up under his vest right here and just filleted his back open. He is screaming bloody murder. He would not let us take his vest off because it took this, moving that. So they had to cut this dude's vest off, which is Kevlar, which is no easy task, by the way. I'm just saying this is what the, the adrenaline's doing. He cuts it, split, they open it up. They We patch him up. We pull him out of the Humvee. We set him down. I go back in the Humvee. I see the guy in the back seat, back passenger side. He had his window up, and there was ball bearings all in his glass, this armor. And dude was just staring at the window, man. He had that thousand-yard stare going. He was really contemplating shit. And I just remember yelling his name, man, over and over before he finally came to and looked at me. And I said, you all right, man? And he said, yeah. So he jumps out of the Humvee, and... Um, the last guy in there is behind the driver's seat. He had shrapnel on his forehead because then Paul Barron's came in, hit metal, caused more shrapnel to go all over the place. And uh, he was bleeding a little bit. And I said, you all right? And he's like, yeah, man. So he got out of the Humvee and we set him down. And then we go back in and the turret gunner's left and he slumped over the turret gunner. So we're talking, let's talk about standard weight. You're going to have your, your vest on, your two plates, the SOP, standard operating procedure, was you have to have 17 30-round mags at all times. Grenades, flashbangs, uh, and that's just standard operating procedure. Now, you could add more to it. Basically, you had your whole kitchen sink, everything on this vest, everything you needed. So I could not bring him down through the, the bottom of the Humvee. So I had literally had to get out and had to get on top of the Humvee, and we had to pick him up through the top, lay him on the top, bring him down to the hood, and then bring him down to the ground. And the guy who volunteered took my spot was in that Humvee. And uh, so I, I started doing CPR on him, and uh, he was gone, man. There was nothing I could do about it. And... Uh, I had blood from head to toe, and uh, they finally grabbed me and said, there's nothing we can do. We got to go. We got to go. So me and my other buddy, we picked him up. We buddy carried him to the back of my Humvee. We put him in the back seat of my Humvee. And um, we were instructed then to go back to that Humvee, and we had to rip out all sensitive items out of this Hummer. We're talking radios. We're talking Blue Force Tracker. We're talking ammo. We're talking food. We're talking maps. Anything had to be stripped out. So they got this team called a QRF, which is a quick reaction force. And their job is to, in case shit happens, you're going there straight up. Everyone rotates it and goes through this rotation. You go through it for like a week. You know, We all fall in that rotation. One week, we're just QRF. 
We're there in case shit pops off. They're on the way. They're en route. But we have wounded and one KIA, so we had to get to an aid station quick. So we rip all the sensitive items out, and I'm watching this guy, man. He's a freaking monster, bro. He's ripping. I don't know to this day how he got this shit out of that Humvee without tools. He ripped this shit out of there pretty much. And I just remember this Blue Force tracker, which was, I thought, probably the most high-speedest thing you've ever seen in your life. It's an up-to-date, real-time satellite imagery. You could call fire missions off this thing. It was like a, this is 04, bro. And imagine what they got now. It yeah, just, it's probably not now. <laughs> yeah, imagine what they have now, bro. This is back then. I thought it was like, oh, my gosh, this is CIA shit here, you know? <laughs> but uh, anyway, he ripped that out, threw it. That's our Blue Force tracker. That's our GPS. Just keep that in mind. So he throws that. We jump in Humvee. I'm the second Hummer again. We're driving. And we're going through all these mazes. We pull up this place called Modder's Monument. And it looked like a big Hershey kiss, if you can mention it. A huge Hershey kiss. Split. And they all set each other. We pulled in there. And when we pulled in there, they told us at the gate, we don't have an A station. You're going to have to turn back around and go to the green zone. I thought, oh my gosh, this is crazy. We got wounded, you know, you know, adrenaline's pumping, man. And um, we roll back out. I'm second Humvee again. We're going through this maze. In order to get to the green zone, we had to pass the crash site again, right? So we had these concrete barriers up, and it was like literally a maze. So we had to come do a U turn so we can get to the green zone. As we're coming up on it, that Humvee of ours was there, and there was a four-lane highway. And they had done raised the hood up on this Humvee, doused it with gasoline, lit it on fire, and they're up there dancing and praising all on top of this Humvee. And the rage that we got from that, I, I mean, that I had from that was unbelievable. So I remember seeing my buddy, Gets on that 240, he was in the front Humvee, and got on that 240 and started laying down rounds down range, and just was wiping these people out. Man. And it was the first bit of combat I had seen in that in that realm, you know. Um, what was going through your mind when when he was doing that? This is not a game anymore. This is real shit. I got my buddy that's dead in the back seat, man. And I got a guy pretty much sitting on his legs. And we see that shit, and I see George pull it, take off, and just start firing these rounds down range, bro. And um, cars had stopped even with this Humvee, man. He hit every windshield. They started running like roaches. He's, he's like taking them out, man. I seen a guy get hit on the shin that was on top of the Humvee, flipped him off that Humvee when he hit that pavement. Everybody started running. And so he, so picture mine this concrete barrier, right? He's coming up like this, shooting, and he just pulls out to the front like this, and he's laying rounds down range. And uh, I'm the second Humvee. I come around. I got my buddy in the back seat. He's got a saw. He's laying rounds down range out there. We bust this curve. The third Hummer come up. His name was Pappy, the oldest son of a bitch in the U.S. Army who was the E-4. The E-4 Mafia, baby. He just didn't want to change. He had a saw and a 240 at the same time. Da, 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 just laying rounds down range. So I come around this curve. I'm the lead Hummer. I'm the lead convoy on this. Now I'm freaking the hell out. Because I don't know where the hell I'm going. And the last Humvee, the one that started firing first, he pulled in and pulled in and he was in the rear. That was the officer who had a radio to the talk tactical operations center at battalion headquarters. So since we don't have a Blue Force tracker anymore, we don't have a GPS. We don't know where the hell we're going. We're trying to get to the green zone. So I'm waiting on the officer back there who's getting instructions from talk, telling them which way to turn. He then gets on another radio to tell my team leader who's sitting next to me, go left, go right, go left. And then he's relating to me all in real time. You know that was a cluster, okay? And I, I freaked out, dude. I was, I cannot tell you the amount of stress I had in that time, man. It was crazy. I'm screaming. I'm yelling, where am I going? Where am I going? Where am I going? And I'm waiting on this cluster for all this information to come out in real time. So 
he tells me right before he turns, says, turn right, turn right, turn right. So I turn right, and as I turn right, and this is a market area. Like, you know, they got 7-Elevens over there. You know, they don't have gas stations. They have outdoor market areas. So there was literally hundreds of people on both sides of the street. And it was like these buildings, the street was in between it, and the sidewalks were in between that, and that's the market area. We pulled right on this street, and as I'm turning, I see a guy on the rooftop come out with an AK, pops up over the roof. And I yelled, AK, AK, AK. Those start opening fire on us. So what? in essence, what we think it happened was was that they were not expecting us to come back. They were going to ambush the QRF team coming in. But we came back, and they ambushed us. So now we're hitting this crowded area. It's kind of like New York City, huh? And these cars are everywhere. People are walking everywhere, eh? And um, I'm ramming these cars. Bam, bam, bam. It's my job, my duty, my responsibility now to get out of this area of operations. I got a whole team behind me, and these, these people are firing. I'm in a canvas top Hummer with a top. I'm just waiting for a round to come in and touch one of us. You know what I'm saying? So I'm driving. I got my M4 out the window, three-round burst. And, bro, I'm going to be straight up with you. Disclaimer, I don't know if this is going to come back and bite me in the ass, but... I was laying rounds down range, scared to death. Um, didn't know what I was shooting at. Didn't know what was going on. I look over, man, it, and that's, I'm telling you, man, it was just like slow motion, something straight out of the movies, man. I, I, I look over, I see my team leader. He's hanging out of the Humvee, busting rounds on these guys on his rooftops. And I'm seeing these guys fall off these buildings like old Western movies, bro. And I got, we had an up-armored kit on our Humvee. All right, so that means where the canvas top Hummer stopped, there was a gap between this up armored kit that come around. So there was an opening that goes just like this all the way all the way across the side. So my buddy picks his uh, saw up, and he's laying down round, rounds from building top to building top to building top as I'm driving through here. And I don't know if you've ever been hit with a hot shell before, hot brass. I don't think I, I would ever have been hit by anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you did, you'd definitely know about it. Just imagine all three of us in this Humvee firing at the same time. One's got an automatic weapon. I'm, my ears are ringing, bro. It's loud. Um, and when he's spraying these rounds, those round, those brass are coming out the other side. And it's hitting me on my neck as I'm driving. And it burnt the shit out of my neck, bro. And I remember leaning my helmet back like this and hearing that brass just off my helmet. It was slow motion. It felt like it was the most it was the most intense thing I've ever been in my life at that point in time. And um, it was crazy. I can't tell you the thought process I had going on then. I was just trying to get out of this area of operations. I ended up hitting a car and he jackknifed. And we stopped. About that time, I see a, a Zuzu truck over there. He picks up a AK-47 collapsible stock. And I picked my M4 up, and I fired three rounds, burst. It went door, shoulder, neck, flopped over. And when he flopped over, man, I looked over there. I seen this kid could have been older, 10 or 12 years old, eyes big as silver dollars. And that, to this day, haunts me. And, um, you know, I just can't imagine, you know, if somebody had done that to my son, you know what I'm saying? This is all, this is all later down the road thinking, you know, right? Not at the time, but yeah. my dad told me before I went to Iraq. He said, "Son, you're gonna go to war. You're gonna come back, and you're gonna think everybody's changed. But in reality, it's gonna be you that's changed." And I never really sank in until I got back to understand what he meant on that. So, and this is just all within like your first few months, right? Yeah, just got there, bro. Wow, just, and just got there. So I back up. For that jackknife, I pull around, and I'm drive through. It felt like it took 30 minutes. Probably took three minutes. You know what I'm saying? Just get through this area of operations. I smash through it. We get out. And I'm just like crazy that none of us got hit from this canvas top roof. You know what I'm saying? The rounds are hitting the Hummer. They just didn't hit the roof. And I was like, oh, my gosh, dudes, we're driving. We get to the green zone. I pull up at the green zone, and brother, they was already on the uh, 
CNN news called the Baghdad Massacre. There was 109 killed, seven children. And let me tell you what they used to do, though. What they used to do was stage an explosion like that. They wouldn't show that part. They would film the retaliation part of us fighting for our life. They would film that and post that all over the news media here back home. And that's what they did for um, their uh, media, uh, uh, the RPO war, uh, PR wars. That's what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Well, they had to show it was being effective. The war right. was being effective. So all back home, all you hear see is, is us killing everybody, shooting everybody, and blowing everything up. They don't show the shit that happened before that. So it was already on Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera cross referenced it, shared it to CNN, headline news. It was on headline news. And all the doctors and team was waiting for us at when we pulled up. And they were bullet holes and humvees. It was crazy. We get out and they take the wounded. They take the my buddy that was killed, Kenneth Melton. God bless your soul. Thank you uh, for your service. Um, pull him in there and we're sitting there. And this is where shit gets crazy, man. So I got a pull of blood this thick in the backseat of my Hummer that I'm driving for my buddy. And I'm just, I'm sitting over here, I'm looking at this, man. I'm just trying to process all this. This is intense craziness I've ever seen in my life. I'm just like, what the fuck just happened, you know? So team leader comes to us and says, hey, we need to get together. We got to quarterback this. They were locking soldiers up for wrongful killing over there. You know what I'm saying? And I, I just don't agree with that at all. Now, granted, if you're just going around randomly killing folks, that's one thing. But if you're in war and combat happens, you know what I'm saying, unless you've been in that split decision one or two seconds to pull that trigger or not, you don't have no idea what I'm talking about. But those who have know what I'm talking about. I get it. So we had to quarterback our story, bro. And we had to say, this is what we're going to do. This is what happened. And I'm say that because I was shooting out a window. I can't tell you how many people was hit. I don't know. I was focused on the road. I was scared to death. So by all rights, I could have been locked up and arrested, put in prison for that. We quarterbacked our story. We got everything together. We figured out what we was going to say. Which, you know, we told the truth, but, you know, that ambush part, you know, I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't, a couple of us did that, you know, shouldn't have done that. But anyway, neither here nor there. Um, a combat stress team flew in. And we had, uh, I remember taking us up to this room and had this like big presidential oval desk, big long desk. We had to sit around this big long desk. And these guys flew in and they sit down. We had to give our name, rank, social security number, tell them what happened. Well, you already know, and I told you before my childhood that I'm not a very expressful type person. I don't talk about my feelings, and especially something like this. And uh, I really didn't have no talk for these guys, man. I wasn't and really a Dr. Philly-ass type of dude, man. You know what I'm saying? And um, so I gave a name, rank, social security, never said what happened, best I could. And um, they let us go. So we go back, and th- th- this is where it gets even worse. And that not only do I feel guilty now, because that should have been me on that, that Humvee, but I complained like a piece of shit until he volunteered took my spot now he's gone so I had a lot of survivor's guilt from that and um, to make things worse um, I was instructed to take the Humvee and get to clean all the blood out of the Humvee so now I'm cleaning this guy's blood out who volunteered took my spot man so I pull up at this place where they told me to go, and they've been through this drill before. They, they're, they've been here a long time. You know, they're the first wave that came in. They got simple green. They got water hoses. And as soon as I op- they opened the door, it was like no questions asked. They open the door, pop it open, start spraying simple green, start scrubbing everything out. And I felt disrespected as fuck, man, because, I mean, like, <laughs> this is my buddy, man. Y'all just blowing this shit out like it ain't nothing. You know what I'm saying? I, I really had feeling some type of way about that whole operation. And uh, one guy saw that, and he pulled me to the side, and he just talked to me, man. It kind of calmed me down. Had to get all the blood cleaned out. Got all the blood cleaned out. 
go back to the fob. I mean, go back to where I was at. Then I was instructed by a captain to go through all his personal belongings. And I had to read every one of his letters. I had to check everything on his computer. I had to look through everything he had. I invade this man's privacy. I t- he just volunteered for me, died for me. I mean, it just, it really, it was a hard time for me in my life right then. The word is, they told me it cannot say anything to devile the, you know, the Army's name or his family's name. So I'm looking at reading all his notes. Anything that could be possibly that could hurt his his family, his name, or the U.S. Army had to be taken. The Army took his his uh, hard drive, his laptop, left him with nothing. They took all his electronics, SIM cards, blast drive, everything. And uh, I'm reading letters. And there was a picture of him holding somebody else's kids. Could have been this. I don't know what the heck's going on, but I couldn't send that home. So I had to take all this crap out, man. And I just felt like the biggest piece of shit in my entire life right then, at that moment in my life. And um, I get all that done. I get back to the fob at Gunslinger. I think I stayed up for 24 hours pretty much on just pure adrenaline alone. Just like really self-reflecting on what just fuck happened. It was crazy. Do you wish you had told those um, those people that came flew out to talk to you guys how you really felt looking back on it now? No. Uh, they were really just wanting to know what happened. You know what I'm saying? And I would never volunteer to say, hey, I put my M4 out of the window and I was just laying rounds down range. I would never volunteer that at that time. And uh, But I'm still I wasn't a Dr. Philly type ass dude. Um, but I was reflecting on just how serious this shit is. What had just happened? I have to write a letter to his wife now. And, gosh, that was rough, bro. That was rough. And, I mean, what do you say? You know what I'm saying? I mean, so they allowed us to call our families. I remember... It's a nine-hour difference from here to there. And I, I think I called. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning when I called. And I remember like, calling my dad and just crying. Man, this is what's going on, you know. Anyway, like I said, it was already on CNN. It was, this is nuts at how the PR war was going and everything that was going on with the politics of this war that was going on with that. So... Uh, went to the the funeral. You know they had a little memorial there, and everybody's crying. It went dry out in the room, man. I'll never forget. We all got to go in there two by two the day he was killed uh, at the hospital. And this is just how young I was, man. The doctor that was there was a Muslim. He was the U.S. Army. But he was a Muslim. And uh, when I seen that moon and the star on his collar, I just like. Bro, how could you be this? I, I, I had a lot of hatred to that guy, man. I, you know, this is, I was very young at this time. I just couldn't look at him. Why would you represent anything like this when this just happened to this dude right here? You know what I'm saying? I just couldn't fathom it. So uh, I remember tapping him on his chest. I said, we got him back, brother. That was the last thing I said to him. And uh, we went out, our commander talked to us and said, we still got a mission to do. We still got a job to do, mission first. So we we blocked that out. We put it in the back of our memory. We drive on. And uh, it was crazy. That set the tone for the whole tour right there that was on. How long did you stay in Iraq for? We came back in 05. So you, you did about a year? Yeah, a little Maybe 14 months over there. And then you did the rest of your service time in the States, or you were able to just get discharged? (laughs) Yeah. um, So as I'm there, um, the rest of the tour, uh, it was kind of off and on. And what I mean by that, it was like um, they wouldn't do nothing to you for a while. You know, then 
they're all they're doing is regrouping. You know, then they assault us again. They hit us IDs, and it would just be crazy shit all the time. And then they, you know, we kick their ass. They stop, and um, I got kicked off the PSD team. Um, and let me just rewind the things that's going on back home. Mm-hmm. My wife's on that whole tour. I'm calling home. She's never there. You know what I'm saying? My first Father's Day, I call home. And I'll never forget this, man. First Father's Day, I call home. And a dude answered my phone. Proceeded to tell me, never call again on the phone. I'm paying for 10,000 miles away. And said that he's got a new daddy now. I thought, these are some special fucking people, bro. How can you, dude's going to serve your country and you fucking being like that, bro? That takes a special type of dude right there, man. You know, I just couldn't understand it. Hmm. So right after that, we had some mortar rounds land in the, in the farm. You say that just so casually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it happened all the time pretty much, man. But I get off the phone, was in this Haji stand, and we got to use the phone. And as soon as I come out, they rocked in, I don't know, about five or six more rounds. Two, 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 two. And Sergeant Major, I'll never forget, yelling, screaming at my ass, get your ass up there, get out. We get down behind these sandbags. Well, they figured out where it was at. Like I said, a college was there. And there was some westernized Muslims over there. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't all just hardcore gangster Muslims. And, <clears throat> and uh, we go out. It's the first time I got to see how in, in ingenuity, ingenuity these guys had. We're doing a patrol. We're walking through the college. We're tearing down propaganda. Al, uh, Mutata al-Sadar was the gangster of the time, you know, vaulting all these people up. I'm constantly ripping these folders, posters down. <laughs> Anyway, we come up on this yard. We're walking the streets by the, the. We knew it wasn't far. We pretty much got a, you know, an azimuth where it came from. And I walk up on this dude. And it was an American Jeep there, which I thought was odd. And I come walking up on him, and I see this metal rack with these PVC pipe tubes, bro, and this wire running to this big ass eighteen wheeler battery. And I'm just, and this dude's backing up. I'm like, hold the fuck up, bro. Where are you going? You know what I'm saying? Let's get out and talk a minute. He just leaving like it, you know, he don't know what it was, you know, where it come from, in his front yard, you know. We ended up, you know, flex cuffing him, putting an old black hood on top of his ass, let him come in for a while talk to him. But uh, that's my first Father's Day, man. Dude, I can't even imagine. Like, I'm so sorry for what you went through. Just all of that, just right in the beginning, and then the troubles at home, and that's oh, just bro. a whole nother— it, it, Dude, it was—man, it, man, I'm telling you— uh, you know, I used to have thoughts of this, man. I don't know. But everybody come home from that war fucked up. Everybody. And sometimes I say, you know, this that was the holy land over there. You know what I'm saying? I can't tell you what the fuck we was doing over there. I didn't find any weapons of mass destruction. I didn't find anything over there. Now, there's no question. Saddam is saying he needed to be taken out of power. He should have been done the first time at Desert Storm. But... We were sent over there with our hands tied behind our backs. You know, can't fire unless fired upon. ROEs. But you didn't feel supported? At all. Now, George Bush gave us everything we needed to fight that war. He just sent us in there with our hands tied behind our back. DOD did. Did you feel supported when you came home? Mm. State of Arkansas was not ready for the influx of soldiers coming back with the multitude of problems they had from serving that combat. They were not ready at all, period. But wasn't it just beyond the state level? Shouldn't it have been the federal level, too? Well, the VA is federal. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, they, they, it was intense. Uh, I would say uh, I didn't know anything about the VA, bro, when I got out. Didn't know nothing about it. I know my dad worked there, but I didn't know anything to help me. You know what I'm saying? But back in Iraq, we get kicked off. Now, look, we had our trucks that come in. All right. We would do 12 hours patrols out there. And this is after I get kicked off the PSC team. I get put back on the line unit, which is, that's home, baby. That's where I want to be at. That's where we're getting into the shit. We're kicking doors in. We're tactical checkpoints. We're stopping vehicles. We're searching them. Um, everything. You know, we'd drive through a neighborhood and lieutenant get out and say, first squad here, second squad here. And we'd hit every fucking house on the block, bro. Kicking doors in. Come, we're searching everything. And they're better hiding stuff than inmates. 
Okay, I'm telling you, like they are fr- intense, creative with the way they hide shit. They were allowed one AK and one thirty round magazine when we was there. Which just let that sink in for a minute, okay? Just let that sink in. That, that just kind of tells you how crazy it was. Um, I've gone in houses. Now I'm on the line unit. And I, I got to see both sides of the wards. Let me say that. I got to, when I was on the PSC team, I got to see the politics side of the war. Because really everything for Captain Bubb's politics. And I got to see that side. And then when I got put on the line unit, I got to see the real shit. What's the, the dudes in the trenches for real, what they're doing, which is where I'd rather be. I remember we were paying the Iraqi National Guard. Um, we were paying them their salaries. I was sitting out in front of this building one day, and I seen this guy talking. And, I'm, you know, if they had English for interpreter, I always loved talking to people. And um, he said he was a major in Saddam's army. Republican, I don't forget what they call it, Republican Army or whatever, I don't remember what it was, but um, he was artillery. So he shot down F-16 fire pilots and did a storm. I'm just looking at this like, for real, bro, who the f- you talking to, man? But, is what he told me, he had an order from Saddam Hussein to either, I don't remember, either put everyone in this house or take everyone out of this house. He didn't do it. He put him in a one-meter box underground. One-meter box, bro, on his knees. All he could do was lean back. One-meter box. They had a lid on him. They would piss on top of this dude, put cigars out on him, throw his food down there. He'd use the bathroom down there. He did everything down there. Six months, bro. Wow. We came over and invaded Iraq. We freed these people and gave them jobs. So, I mean, just a humbling experience, bro, just seeing all this and taking all this in, listening to all this shit that's going live around there. So half these people we freed... Uh, they were prisoners, but you got to understand the Iraqi people didn't know what free will was, what free choice was. They were ran by food, water, and electricity, and um, they didn't they didn't buck back. There was none of that. It was either you went for what they said or they killed you. And uh, anyway, I met a guy that's at our gate, and I just pictured this. We stayed right by the Tigris Euphrates River. And this fob, um, you had an outer gate, then you had the inner gate. The outer gate was ran by the Iraqi National Guard, which I didn't trust all of them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then you had our gate, right? I'm gonna tell you why I didn't trust them. The highest paid one guy that I was telling you about, he was a major, was being paid $147 a month, a month. Okay, and they thought they were king shit living. Yeah. So you've got an insurgent that comes through and says, hey, I'm going to pay you $50 cash. You tell us when this convoy comes by. Who do you think they're going to do, man? They're going to do it. They're taking that money every time. And not only that, if you don't help them, they'll kill you and your family. So, man, we spent more time watching guys that were supposed to be on our side than the actual enemy that's out there. So keep that in mind. We're at a gate one day, and every week, just like rotation, I said we did a QRF. Once a week, every every one month or so, you had to pull five security. So you were there in towers, and you were there at the gates, and you're pulling security. And uh, I remember seeing this guy at this gate had one tooth on his mouth, in his mouth, in his head, man. But every time we drove out, he blew kisses and said, I love you. Every time I seen this guy, I'm, I'm like, it got to the point, I was like, what the hell's wrong with this dude? Every time I come through here, man, he's blowing the peace signs and throwing the kisses up. And uh, so I'm now on FOB security. I got an uh, interpreter with me. I actually get a chance to go talk to this guy. And I was like, man, I'm just wanting to know. Every time I see you, you're throwing up the peace signs and blowing kisses at us, man. What's going on? Brother, he told me that he was learning to speak English. And when Saddam's regime found out, they killed his entire family. Locked him up in prison, pulled all his teeth out, drilled holes in him, put cigars out on him, cigarettes out on him, and when we came to Iraq, we freed him. Oh wow! I'd be living America too, <laughs> you know. But now it all made sense. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. So he gave us some homemade sweet tea 
They had some crazy ass sweet tea over there, bro. I'm I'm from the south. I like sweet tea, but it was hotter in Africa. I'm just telling you, it was just hot. But you know, you're in 140 degree weather. You think you'd want some ice? Come, there ain't no ice over there, man. Yeah, they don't <laughs> have ice, right? <laughs> well, they do, but you ain't wanting it because they sell it on the side of the road in big blocks, and they cut you off, cut you off with a machete, hand it to you. I'm like, mm, I'm good. I'll pass on that. But so I drank this hot tea, man, because you know it's, I didn't want to disrespect them. Oh my gosh, bro. Felt like I was on meth. I think I don't have so much sugar in that. I got diabetes right off the rip. But anyway, so um, I meet these guys that just really touched my heart, man. It's just the craziness that these people were. Um, I stayed at Uday Hussein, Uday Hussein's Palace a couple times, and I met a cook who used to cook for him. You know, these folks had like four or five food testers before he even took a bite of his own food. <laughs> I mean, bro, that's It's like wow. the president. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. You got to live a life like that. You know what I'm saying? But um, he would tell me stories about Uday, who I think was probably more evil than Saddam, uh, would pick these women up at the colleges and rape them, right? We're in the back pool. This palace is so big. His, well, this whole compound was huge, but this palace was so big, bro. We dropped a 220-pound bomb in the living room, and the other half still intact. It came outside to this marbling gold heated pool. It cascaded down to the Tigris River. It goes underground. Everything's gold. Gold spigots, gold bidets, everything down there. And I swim in this pool. He had this artificial grass like you see at a golf course. You know what I'm saying? This big old chunk of this artificial grass and with a swing sitting on it. And dude would tell me he would take these women, he'd rape them. Then he would put them in a wood chipper, feet first, alive, and sip his tea and watch his entertainment. These people are crazy, bro. Fucking nuts. Fucking insane. But, you know, Americans are doing the fucking wood chipper shit, too. You see those murderers that are put away for the wood chipper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they, maybe those people get it from the Americans. <laughs> dude, it was insane. Uh, the stories I heard about Uday and the shit that went on, man, it just. Oh, my gosh, man. So when I hear people today say they hate America, I just, I just, I'm flabbergasted, bro. I don't understand these people at all. You know, it goes back to that bubble. But um, anyway, we'd have at the FOB one hot meal a day that would get transported from, from Taji to us. They have a mobile kitchen. We'd get one hot meal a day. Every day it was MREs. You know what I'm saying? I'm telling you right now. I slept on a cot. And I ate chili cheese burritos for breakfast. It started getting really fucking old. You know what I'm saying? Chicken tetrazzinis and, you know, everything you can think of. The MREs are pretty good these days. But um, got done with all that, man. Started doing that. Got put on the line unit. Started doing a lot of raids. Started doing a lot of, you know, in the trenches shit that was going down. Um, you know, seeing it come across one guy. I'll never forget was doing the. 12-hour shift patrol, hotter than that. Dude, it was hot. And uh, we pulled back into the FOB, and they said there was an explosion that took off on the route between Taji and Gunslinger, which is where our hot meal. We got our mail come through there. We got clothes cleaned through there. Everything applied on that supply route. Well, they kept hitting this thing with IDs, and then they'd stop getting anything, so then we're not having clothes, Right. We're wearing the same pair of musty-ass uniforms. Dude, let me tell you something. You take five guys, I mean, you can put a brand-new uniform on, okay, and go out there and do your job and come back, and when you take them off, they would stand up on their own, and you would look like something off Twilight from all the sparkling salt that's coming out of your body. That's how bad it was. Now, that's just one day wearing it. Imagine going multiple days with no laundry because the supply rats keep getting IED'd. And you're having to wear the same ass, funky ass uniform every day. Smell like a bag of smashed up assholes. And then you times that by four other people in a Humvee. It's rough. It's rough. So, uh, and I love this shit. You know what I'm saying? I really love it. <laughs> what was the last time you reflected on all this? Have you ever even had a conversation with someone about these things, these memories? So here's the deal. Uh, and I'll tell that toward the end. But I never used to talk about this, you know, because I had so much survivor's guilt. And um, it wasn't until the last time I went to prison that I went to the VA and I laid everything out and got transparent and um, come to realization that 
every time I talked about this, it had no longer had an effective power over my life. And the more I talk about it, not only am I telling my story, but I'm telling his story. And You're also ha- uh, able to help others in the process, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, but I was, from this point, it was a long way away, man. Um, anyway, I, I finished the tour out. Uh, that, that one patrol I was telling you about, we turned around, we had to go back, and these dudes were setting up an IED and blew themselves up. And, bro, there was body parts everywhere, all over the place. And we come to the scene, and this dude's heart looked like it was perfectly cut out with a pair of surgical scissors, how great it was. I was like, oh, my gosh, man. I'm like, I told my captain, I'm not picking that shit up. You can hang it up. Call that wrecking national guard out here. You know what I'm saying? So uh, we go back, man, and uh, anyway, uh, we lost three more people to an IED, uh, three good buddies of mine. Uh, we lost a total of four out of our company. Um, my wife, who's currently on that whole tour, um, got on drugs or bad. I didn't even know who she was anymore. Eight years with a person, didn't even know who she was, man. That was when you came back. Yeah, so I'm catching all this in real time. So let me tell you what she did. Just uh, some of the games she played real quick. She would go to, now look, she's getting all my money. And when I caught wind to it, 10,000 miles away, I had my numbers were just decreasing in my bank. That means I was dodging bullets and bonds for free over there. It sounds really awesome. You know what I'm saying? Team America. And I finally put a stop to that. I was paying her my BAH housing and my family separation pay. Okay. Um, my mom back in the rear with all the gear was keeping tabs on this right in the paper trail. And um, she then goes to the National Guard and said, I had abandoned my child. There's two things the Army does not like, beating your wife's ass or not paying for your kid. So the State Command Sergeant Major in Arkansas flies to Iraq to have a meeting. And you know it's pretty serious. When I was a discussion of this meeting of her flying, the State Command Sergeant Major come flying to Iraq, and this I'm a part of this conversation, bro, you know how humil- humiliating that was for me? Mm. So I'm on my battalion commander's personal security team. And uh, apparently she got, got all this free money, emergency funds, thousands of dollars, emergency funds. And uh, the colonel calls me in his office, and he asks me, what the hell's going on? You're not paying for your kid. Well, I mean, humiliated, bro. Like, I was doing this. You know what I'm saying? I did. Now I'm looking sh- like a piece of shit for my commander, who I'm on his personal security team. And I assured him, sir, I am doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. I'll get all the documentation you need to prove that I'm doing. But here's the problem. It ain't like you just put in a fax machine and send it over. It's three three weeks to a month before you get mail over there. So I called my mom, and I got to wait for a whole month. I feel like just every time he see me, he thought I was a piece of shit. You know what I'm saying? Tells they would prove otherwise. But anyway, these were the games she was playing while I was in Iraq. So she abandoned my child. Um, and once that happened, I came home. You know, they sent me home a month early before everyone else did. And uh, so this is where I kind of got screwed on the whole deal. I came home before everybody did. And I told you, Arkansas was not ready for the influx of soldiers that came back with a multitude of problems. So I came back, and I fell through the cracks. You're supposed to demob, you know, saying demobilization, prepare you to reintegrate into society from a combat zone. I never got that. So this is the biggest joke that the U.S. Army says, if you're infantry or anything of that matter. Go to combat, do the shit you do, see the shit you see, experience all the experiences, and then they come home and say, hey, be normal again. That is the biggest joke of my fucking life, bro, right there. So I'm back. I'm in this fucked up, crazy relationship, man. And, you know, I just wanted to keep my marriage working. And uh, I didn't know who she was anymore, man. So I came home to a fucked up mess, bro. I'm just, I'd rather put me back on the front lines in Iraq than I came home and deal with this shit. <clears throat> so I came home, got cuts to my kid, grabbed him, took him. But then, you know, I'm coming to reality and I'm thinking, I am in no place to be a full-time mom and dad right now. I'm just coming home from Iraq. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, my dad said, you're going to go to war. You're going to come back. You're going to think everybody's changed. But in reality, it's going to be you that's changed. Well, that never sank in until I got back home. 
when I got back home, the silence screamed the truth to me. You know what I'm saying? It all hit me like a ton of bricks. And now I got this kid, and it was, uh, it was, it was bad time. So I decided to make the adult decision, was to leave him with his grandparents who was raising him already. Your parents or? No, hers. Her parents, okay. So I did that. Now, I didn't know anything about the VA, bro. I didn't know anything about PTSD. I didn't know anything about trauma. I didn't know anything about anything. You know what I'm saying? So I just know <clears throat> I was coming back and I was supposed to be normal again, which did not happen, by the way. So the more I started understanding this, the more I tried to get to the person I was before I went to Iraq. And the harder I chased it, the further lost I got. And I had come to realization I was chasing ghosts. That person's not there anymore. He'll never come back. I'm a different person now. And uh, there was no matter what I did to get back to that, going to work every day, coming home to one woman, paying my bills on time, all that was out the window. I didn't know anything when I got back. So I started hanging out with this guy, man. I had a lot of bad dreams when I got back, when I first got back. And um, he said, man, I got the answer for you. Let's do some math. That sounds like a great idea. Did you know anything about drugs at that I point? I did. Okay. I, I had tried meth before, um, but I never got bad on it. You know what I'm saying? Like, just, you know, junkied out, nothing like that, you know? So um, when I got back, I got on it. And that was it for me, man. That was like that instant gratification, self-medication. You know what I'm saying? Finally, I got something to cope with this shit. It desensitized me from all my feelings. Anytime something came up about anniversary dates of my buddy who had been killed, anything, his name come up, anything like that, man, I go get high, go get high, go get high. And um, it worked at first, man, for what it was designed to do. But that's a trap. It's always the trap. And uh, by the end, I couldn't get out of bed unless I had it. You know what I'm saying? And so I got bad on it, man. I went balls deep in it. I'm, you know, man. I had the world by the balls when I got back, man. I could have done anything I wanted to. My my actual my dream has always been a cop, believe it or not, which is crazy. And um, so anyway, that 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 ship sailed, you know. So um, I started catching these charges, bro. I, I'm doing dope, and then I knew in my mind that I was not going to be buying dope off the street. And these money do screw me over because. I'll just fuck around and kill somebody. I mean, I, that's how I was in that mindset then. And I didn't have time for that. So what do I do? Well, I'm kind of like you, an entrepreneur. I just started to start cooking meth. You that started was, cooking meth? That was a great idea. <laughs> Not really. But, yes, I was cooking uh, methamphetamine. And selling it, too? And selling it. Wow. But, and using it. Oh, yeah. I was my best customer. Don't get that twisted. Okay. You know so saying? you weren't like a, a kingpin master. No, 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 no. You were just I'm like a low level. Yeah. I was never really in it for the money. You know, I was in it to get high. To support your habit. That's right. And uh, it makes you appreciate a home-cooked meal so much better. You know what I'm saying? So I'm cooking dope now. And, uh, you know, I'm not worrying about this chasing people down and getting screwed, cutting my dope up. No, I know what's going on in this. Better ingredients make better pizza at Papa John's. You know what I'm saying? There's fresh ingredients in here. So I'm doing that. Still at this point, I'm just like, I'm not really seeing how bad this is destroying my life. What about your fellow army soldiers? That n No one's in touch with you? There's no— They're still in Iraq, bro. Oh, uh, but, but when they came back, yeah. So when they came back— It was too late? It was too late by then, bro. Okay. I was already locked in. And when we get high, I, when I get high, I disappear. Like, I don't want to be around nobody that's normal. The last thing I wanted to do was go around somebody who got this shit together. Next thing you know, I'm not going to drill— I'm not reporting in, you know, so. Um, oh, you're still in this active in the service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I I'm thought you were in. done. See, I came back. When I came back, I fell through the cracks. And, no and one, you were on drugs while still in the yeah, oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. But see, I was no, no way to be held accountable because everybody was gone to war at this time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but when everybody came back, um, I started calling, going AWOL. I wasn't coming in like I was supposed to. I was too ashamed to. And anyway, um, I'm meanwhile cooking dope, going through everything, going crazy. Um, I get charges here. They never actually busted me cooking meth, but they busted me with like 
I got busted in Lone Oak. You know, just like Jimmy, I I did time at jail at Lone Oak. Oh, you were at the Lone Oak County Bro, Jail? I went to prison twice from Lone Oak. The same one that we were in yes. and that you work in now, which we'll all get into. Yes. But wow. Yes. So um, I got busted with a heat lamp bulb and a, half, a quarter gram of dope and a hose, and they charged me criminal intent to manufacture. Okay. Well, no, it was Red Devil Eye. So um, I got that charge. get on probation. All right. And I'm just thinking to myself, I never want to come back to this town, Lone Oak, again. <laughs> So I transferred my probation to Pulaski County. Now, I'm trying to keep us on the loop because if the Army found out I got these charges, then I'm going to be growing up on UCMJ, you, you know, Uniform Code of Military Justice, court martial through them. They didn't even know? They didn't even know. Oh, man. So um, anyway, so I'm skating by through this, man. So I, I transferred my probation to Pulaski County, which is if you're going to do time and you're going to be on probation, Pulaski County is the place to do it because they're so overwhelmed. There's so many caseloads on them that like, they don't even care. If you ain't breaking charges, breaking the law or anything, you're good to go. Paying your fees, you're Gucci. You know what I'm saying? That's how they look at it. So when you get to those small rural towns, that's when they start getting anal retentive on drug testing and make sure you're, you know, home checks. They never did that in Plas County, never. So um, anyway, I'm accumulating all these charges. Um, I got some violent charges. Um I never thought they'd put my punk ass in prison. You know what I'm saying? I never thought they're going to lock somebody up in prison, man. So um, they told me I got arrested one time. Well, the Army put an AWOL warrant out for my arrest because I went AWOL. And I remember going to jail, getting locked up. And while I'm in jail, they come down to pick me up. The Army does. My buddy does in combat with. And I'm sitting there. And I'll never forget the Little Rock cops like, you're not going to put him in handcuffs? And they were like, no, we're not gonna put him in handcuffs. You know what I'm saying? I was like, "Fuck you!" You know what I'm saying? So, I end up getting in the van with them. They ride me all the way out to Searcy, Arkansas, where my unit was at. I get there and I come out, and they are busting my rank all the way down. And then they were like, "We're signing you. Up. We're letting you go from the military. We're we're releasing you." Honorably or dishonorably? I got honorable, but okay. they were like, "They, they could have screwed me. They could have gave me an you know an unhonorable." Oh, and then you wouldn't have gotten your benefits. Nothing. Wow. But they knew what was going on. And they, I served with these guys. They knew I was genuine. They knew I loved my country. They knew I loved serving. They knew I loved this. And matter of fact, uh, Shane Griffiths, the guy that was served with over there, he was like, don't do it. Don't sign it. File an appeal. And you'll, you'll, they'll take your rank, but you can still stay in. File an appeal. But at that point in time in my life, I felt like I had let down my country so much by doing the shit I was doing. That I just went ahead and did it. I thought that was the honorable thing to do. How much time did you have left in your contract? About three more years. Oh, you would add three. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and what, did you renew like for a second time? Or mm -mm. that's oh. my first initial one. You know, and I man, I it was one of those crossroad moments for me, man. And I really felt like this was the right thing to do. That I let everybody down. Do you feel like your country let you down at all? In in, in any ways at that point in time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I feel like they let a lot of folks in. They're still continuously doing that. So, uh, but at this time, I didn't really understand all that until a little on down the road. But I signed out. I got out. And I'm just depressed, bro. I'm just like, man. So what do we do when we're depressed? Well, we go out and cook more dope. We get we desensitized to it. And we just push those films away like it never happened. So that's what happened. I stayed high. I had a lot of things on my mind, bro. I had nothing positive. I felt like I had failed everything in life, relationships, my country, my buddy that was killed in Iraq. And it was, all this kept me in this addiction, man. And it just kept me there. And um, when that civil back gorilla gets on your back, it's a done deal. And, you know, I'm, I'm, my life revolved around getting pills to cook the meth, the pseudoephedrine getting my stuff to make dope with. And it, if it didn't involve me cooking meth or getting high, I had nothing to do with it. So I shut everybody out, man. I was just isolated. And it was a really dark time in my life, bro. And um, that's what my, that's, that's was my whole life right there. And then um, I kept getting more charges, kept accumulating more charges, kept accumulating more charges. And, um, I, got, I get with this girl, and 
a strictly gutter butt trifling asshole. Currently comes to the neighborhood near you. I've been knowing a few of these, by the way. Just let me throw that out there. Um, we go to Colorado, bro. So here's the deal. State of Arkansas stopped selling pseudofedrin, right? And then they stopped selling the sale of 7% tinctured iodine, which was a key ingredient to make meth at the time. But this girl I was used to date lived in Colorado, and the, col- and the iodine and everything's wide open there. So she's like, fly here, you know, and then I'll get you some iodine. You can come make good dope. Psst, bro, I'm on my way to Colorado. I'm not even thinking about it. Let me tell you how crazy I was. And I'm, I just want to make this clear. I'm not glorifying any of this shit because I don't really like talking about shit like this. But I'm going to tell you. I cooked dope the night before I went to Colorado. I did about two pulls off of it, left the rest for the dudes at his house. I had a you know quarter, quarter ounce of dope. And my dumb ass, how high I was, I'm going to the Little Rock National Airport with dope in my fucking pocket. So I remember I had an Arkansas jacket. I had khakis on. I'm cool, calm, collective. I'm walking up. I'm seeing everybody take their jackets off, their belts off, and their shoes off. So I calm as day, reached my hand in there, pulled this sack of dope out, which was fresh. You can still smell the camp fuel on it, right? I just got through cooking it. I put it in my pocket. Take my shoes off, take my belt off, take my jacket off, sit in the thing, run through the conveyor belt. Bam. I'm walking through the thing, and he tells me, hey, I need you to step over here. And I'm like fucking freaking the fuck out. Like, why did he pick me out of all these people? There's a glass partition wall there with two footsteps. I had to go over there, and I had to hold my hand out. So I'm nice and calmly, put my hand in my pocket, wadded that dope up in my hand, and did just like this. Two Little Rock cops sitting five, five feet away from me, bro, talking. I'm ready to gumby out of my clothes. You know what I'm saying? So I'm sitting there, he passed me down. I put the dope back in my pocket, grab my shit, and get on the plane. Wow. Dude, how fucking insane was that? You know what I'm saying? How insane was this? So anyway, I'm just I'm just rolling on a cloud, bro. Life is going nowhere. It was darkness, man. I, it took everything from me. It took my my place to live, uh, my cars, you know, um, dignity, everything. Freedom. It took, it took everything. So um, I'm doing an anhydrous cook one night with this guy, and um, I've been up for days, and I fall asleep. Well. He woke me up to a 30-unit bump in my arm, intravenous using for the first time in my life. And it, I came up out of a coma. It was like Lazarus coming up out from the dead, bro. And I got that taste of what it felt like to shoot up. I would have never done that myself. I say that, but probably not. And But once I got that taste, it was over with. And then that's when things really took a dark turn for me because... That was everything. I chased that high all the time. I'm cooking more dope. There was not one night I could tell you that went by that I was not manufacturing something. And, you know, people were snitching on me. I was getting set up. They were telling me, like, uh, I'm supplying half an old Little Rock. You know, it's, no, bro, I'm cooking for myself and a few people around me. You know what I'm saying? But um, I got set up. I learned a lot, man. I learned a lot of the dope game and how trifling it was and couldn't trust nobody. Uh, a buddy of mine I served in combat with was on dope, and he was still active duty drill sergeant at camp, Robinson, and they ended up getting caught and they set me up. And uh, I got busted again. And by this time, I had accumulated a shit ton of charges. And when you start throwing them violent charges in there, and that's when they hurry up, got my punk ass off the street. So I go to court one day, and I'm sitting there, and um, 16 felonies. I'm labeled a large habitual offender, first time down. I'm on my way to ADC out of Pulaski County. Now, when I switched from Lono County to Pulaski County, my probation, when I got in trouble in Pulaski County, they sent a petition to revoke my probation at a Lono. And here I am. Now I'm back in Lone Oak. So, which is a very strict, tough on drugs. Does not play county. no sillies. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you, it does not play no sillies, bro. I mean, Arkansas in general doesn't right. play when it comes to the drugs. So, I get sentenced ten years out of Pulaski County. All right, I've never been down before. I'm new to all this. You know what I'm saying? 
So I don't know what to expect. Of course, you see the movies and Hollywood and what they portray. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this shit's about to get crazy. And I'll never forget sitting around one night cooking dope. And the guy who taught me how to cook dope was in there. We're sitting around telling flash stories. And he tells me, he says, Springer, when you go to prison and you're going to go to prison, sit back and watch the entertainment. There will be a part of the entertainment. That really stuck with me. You know what I'm saying? Because that was a very true statement. So when I'm in prison. Um, I get sentenced. I go to prison, bro. Before I get sentenced, I get transferred over to Plat- Lone Oak County. They gave me five years, ran concurrent at the time I got out of Pulaski County. So I'm like, bet, I'm done. Clean slate. Let me go knock this time out, and I'll be out. I'm starting off fresh ground, get my head right. Now, by this time, I've already been in jail. So by this time, reality's starting to come back. That monkey's off my back, right? You know, I, I'd say this all the time. Einstein said it best. You cannot solve a problem in the same mindset in which the problem began. Someone who's in active addiction cannot see any reality from that. So it's tough for them, for me. So when I got clean a little bit and came back to reality, that's when I started saying, what the fuck am I doing? I mean, I have gave everything away. I Like, I've lost everything, freedom. So a very sobering experience for me was this. And it was, I went to Iraq and fought for fucking people's freedom who did not like me, who did not want me over there in Operation Iraqi Freedom. To come home and have my own dumb ass strip my very freedom away was fucking eye opener. You know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, I did not learn that till the third time I went to prison. But um, how much time did you do in total? So let me tell you this funny story. Mm-hmm. So the ten years I got out of Pulaski County, the way Arkansas works is, I got ten years. I got five years out of Lone Oak. The bigger sentence always ease up the little sentence. It's ran concurrent regardless. So I'm gonna do that ten year sentence. I go. The diagnostics. I sit in this one man cell for about fourteen fucking days. I leave there thinking I'm going to my prison unit. No, we're a part of this rotation that goes to this called JCJ Overflow in case it gets overflowed. And we're sitting there for another thirty five fucking days, and then I finally get to go to my actual unit, Brickies, the Brick House. And bro, it was fucking crazy at Brickies. So I'm there. I do my time, bro. I became 1B, which is one of the highest trustees you can get. I was working farm crew, and I went there at classification after I did my whole squad, which is no fucking joke, by the way. I don't know if y'all have whole squad up here, but down in the south, they got whole squad. Yeah, um, Jimmy was telling me about that. They No fucking sillies, bro. <laughs> I mean, it's 60 days, hardcore, gangbang action. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I went to basic training. It wasn't as rough as that down there. Yeah, right? give us, like, one crazy uh, story on that. So— um, we would go to these places in the middle of nowhere, bro. We'd march about two miles out with these hoes, this nine-pound Aggie, this dull as shit. And we'd go out there to these big rivers, you know, l- ravines and stuff, right? The grass would be this tall, man. We'd get at the top, nut to butt, lined up, and we're chopping every bit of this glass, grass, and sidelining it, which means it's nothing but dirt. And we're dragging it all the way down this hill. The, when you get to the bottom of the river, the, the mound, the grass beat is high. And then as they turn around, flip on it. We're flipping, we're dumping it in this river. And it looks like just straight dirt action all the way down. That's what we did. That's all we did, bro. That's what we did for no reason. So every day, all day action, we were out there doing that for 60 fucking days. And the problem was, they, you could adjust to the work, I guess, you know what I'm saying? You can, you know, adjust to that. But the problem was the psychological warfare that went with it because. You have the whole squad rider up there saying shit like, get your grass or it's your ass, I'm going to write you up. Now, if you're getting your grass and you don't get your grass and somebody else has to get it for you, well, that means you're going to be paying something when you get back into barracks, man. Some kind of, you know, something. And uh, if you didn't get the grass, the sergeant got your name and number, man, he was on your ass, he could write you a disciplinary. And once you wrote you that disciplinary, that mellow yellow, that means you're stuck in the whole squad for another six months before you get your class back, bro. So it was very, a lot of anxiety, high stress to make sure you do what you did just to get the fuck out of there. So I got blessed <laughs> because they have classification. They have a job called Farm, Q, farm Crew. And uh, apparently it was a drop made. 300, 400 some packs of top tobacco was dropped. 
in the major. He comes down there. He says, I know there was a drop made. I know you motherfuckers got it. I'm going to get in that fucking truck. I'm going to go down that fucking road. And when I come back, that top better be on this table. The tobacco better be on this table. So he gets in that truck. He goes down the road. The one the, There was three bosses that worked, civilian bosses that worked in the farm crew. And he's like, man, I don't want to see you guys get locked up. Man, just bring the tobacco out. Just set it on the table. You know what I'm saying? It's just, just give him what he wants, man. I don't want to see none of y'all get locked up. He said he's going to lock you up if you don't got all that tobacco. So they go back there and they dig up these five-gallon buckets of tobacco. And they drop two of them on the table. like 60 packs. He says, man, he said there's something like 300-something packs, guys. I'm telling you, I don't want to see you guys go to jail. Let's get these packs. Let's put it on here. So they go out there and they get every bit of this fucking tobacco. They bring it back. And Major comes down the road again. He looks at that tobacco on the table. He says, lock all these motherfuckers up. So, dude was ruthless, man. You know what I'm saying? So now the whole farm crew was empty. So I'm going up to classification. First time up, you know. I don't know. I don't know how it is in the feds, but in the state, man, you you stand on this two footprints. And you got this whole panel, and like every job in the prisons, bosses are there. Oh, really? And you yeah. have the warden in the center. They don't do that in the feds. <laughs> yeah, and the warden's in the center, and they just pretty much talk shit on you. And behind you is a projector that's got. All your charges, everything about you on there, you can't look back and look at it or nothing. They jew your ass out. So they're sitting there, and they're all just deciding who wants who. You know what I'm Ask me what I do and all this. And one guy said, can you drive a tractor? Hell yeah, I can drive a tractor. Yes, sir. I want him. Bam. I'm on farm crew. I'm 1B, which is great. I'm literally in Compton, what they call Compton. I call Compton. South Hall, whole squad barracks. You get, this is the biggest joke ADC does. So when you first come into prison, you're class two, all right? And while you're there, they throw you in the mix of class fours and class threes, who people don't give a shit, who whole squad junkies, you know what I'm saying? And they throw you in the middle of this and expect you, if you get in any trouble, bro, you're going class four. You know what I'm saying? So I made it through that. I get one B. I'm down in the easy barracks, bro. I'm like, these folks work for the warden. They're going to bed at normal times. It's quiet. It's it's oh, okay. I like it. Well, anyway, so I do my time. I'm farm crew. Everything's great. Let me tell you what happened. You asked me how much time it did. The OJTs, which is the new trainees, they came in and gang banged the whole bus loads. And they, what they do is they'll hit a prison and they hit it all simultaneously and they hit every barracks at one time. They found weed, they found tobacco, they found knives, shanks, cigarettes, I mean, lighters, everything. Tattoo motors, cash, they collect it all. And apparently they take it out to this one spot and they burn it, the caches. So, I'm working farm crew. Um, there's a, a job called Horse Barn, where they get the horses ready for the whole squad riders for a whole squad and all this, and... He's out there bush hogging one day, and he comes across his cachet. You remember me telling you earlier, but New York reminds me of the penitentiary. Everybody's hustling something. Mm-hmm. Well, he comes across all this tobacco, and he's like, oh, my gosh, I've hit the jackpot, man. So what they did do, they went out there and burned it. A lot of them didn't burn. But what they did is poke holes in everything, pour hydraulic fluid all over it, and they'd light it on fire. So he's got a ton of tobacco that didn't burn. And, of course, everybody got that hustling mentality. They want to put it in the barracks. So you are thinking that ADC is controlled movement. So what they do is they bring it in. I know how they bring this shit in, too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They bring it in, and then they give it to a barracks porter, and the barracks porter is the only one who's allowed to go to the next barracks. And now that's that's how shit gets transported all the way down the hall. And that's how it's going. Well, they're smoking this shit in the barracks, bro, and I'm seeing it, and it's got that hydraulic fluid on it, bro. So they're smoking it, and it's like, sizzling at the end of the cigarette, like known cancer agent state of California. You know what I'm saying? It's pretty terrible. So everybody's pissed off about this tobacco. So Duke takes it out there, what he's got a lot, and he starts washing it in water. And I was talking to him. I said, bro, you can't put tobacco in fucking water. It's fucking, you're going to take it all away. I said, bring it to me at the horse barn. I'm a dope cook. I'm thinking dope cook mentality. All right, it's just like making metal. He brings it out there to me. I put it in newspapers. I put it in a, a vice, and I'm pressing it out. I take it out. Replace it. Put new newspaper. I do it about 16 times. 
you're never going to get all the hydraulic fluid out of this fucking tobacco. But it started coming back to natural color. Then I gave it to him. That's about the extent I had with that operation. Okay. Well, this uh, black guy in prison, he's a barracks porter, uh, gets talked crazy to one night. Now, he's been down 18 years on a rape charge. You know what I'm saying? Gets talked crazy to by this black dude. And uh, the next day, I come in the barracks. I mean, I felt embarrassed for him. You know, it's how bad he talked to him. I come in, and he says something smart to me. I was talking to my guys over there. I look at him and say, bro, I wasn't even talking to you, man. You know what I'm saying? I was talking to these dudes. I don't know why are you even talking to me like that. You know, why are you asking me shit? Well, then he got in his feelings. I guess he wasn't going to get talked to by, by no white guy. Crazy. So he was like, oh, I don't think you hit no gorilla. I don't think you hit no gorilla. And I'm like, oh, shit, here we go. So in the hallways, they're like 20-foot high glass bars. You know what I'm saying? And the guards just walk up and down the hallways if they're on the guard booth. And he's here he comes. He's coming to me, man. I don't think you hit no gorilla. I don't he went to grab my shirt and I just hit him three times. Bop, bop, bop. And it went defense. Pam blocked a punch, pushed him back, and then we got separated from the guys in the barracks. So I learned just by watching entertainment, not being a part of the entertainment, right? That you never go to bed with someone angry at you. You know what I'm saying? Because you never know what's gonna happen in there. So I let everything cool down for a little bit. And I go up there and I, I shake his hand and say, hey, we good? He looked at me, smiled, a little go tooth, and he said, I didn't think he was going to hit no gorilla. And I said, well, now that we know, I just want to make sure we're good. So I say that to say this. He takes that tobacco because dude didn't want to pay him back his money for it, takes it straight to the major's diet desk, drops that big old sack on the desk, and puts my name inflicted in all this crap that's going on. All right. So, I'm driving a tractor miles away from the prison, enjoying it. I mean, just really getting away from the prison. It's good. I don't have to have a gun on me by myself. I'm just tilling up the land. You know, I don't know. You don't know about that up here, but down there, they look at that a little differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see this truck coming to the field, bro. And it's the fucking lieutenant and it's the fucking whole squad rider. I stopped the tractor, turned it off. And uh, he says, Springer. Come catch his cuffs, man. I said, what the fuck? I get down, they put me in these handcuffs. And what they do down there is they'll throw you in the back of that truck. And you're handcuffed behind your back. And then they hit every bump going everywhere. You're flopping around this truck, man, like all over the place, bro. I mean, it's serious. And I was a couple miles away from the prison, bro. So this was a pretty rough ride. So I get there. They pull me out of the back of the truck. I got dust. Looked like I've been a coal miner. I got so much dust on me from these fields in my face from the way they were driving. And uh, I pulled me straight in the major's office in front of the major. Major says, Springer, tell me about this tobacco. I said, Major, I don't know nothing, sir. He said, lock his punk ass up. Bam! Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. I'm going to jail. Well, I'm max traffic, heading to the hole. I'm like, what the fuck? And it's summertime. Let me tell you about Arkansas down now. <laughs> Arkansas is hard in the son of a bitch. You hear me? They don't have AC in the hole. They have an attic fan system that blows hot air in there. You know what I'm saying? And that's all you got. That's it. I'm in the middle of dead beat of summer, bro. I'm locked in this fucking cell. So I got to experience the full experience. All right. I'm in the hole now. Um, they come in and take your mat at 6 o'clock in the morning. You don't get it back till 8 o'clock at night. We're supposed to be 6, but it's usually 8 or 9. And um, you get no books. You got no nothing. They come in. This was the biggest fucking joke. They would come in when you're locked down 24 hours a day. They would come in and handcuff you to these bars, and they would shake down your fucking cell. Like, what the hell I got in here, man? Ain't, I ain't seen nobody. You a mouse bringing me something in here? Because I ain't seen <laughs> shit. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, they do that. I guess it's a psychological thing, bro. But they would take you three days a week and shower. And when they would take you to the shower, that's the only entertainment excitement you got for the whole week. That was it. That's all you look forward to. They would handcuff you, had a leather strap that goes to your feet shackles, and they would walk you like a dog down the shower. And if you get to acting up, they would just pull up on that strap, and you're going to go down face first. Bust your ass open. Which I never did that, by the way. I had seen it done. But they put you in the shower. They lock you into the shower. They turn this fire hydrant 
fucking pressure of water on. If it was hot, if it was cold, I don't know. You were lucky. And they would break off this half a bar of soap, and they get it to you. And they say, you got three minutes. I'm in there washing my ass. And then they get me out, give me this half a piece of sheet or a little towel, whatever they had conveniently located. I dry off with it, put back in the I had to give them back the towel, and they'd escort me like a dog back to my cell. Wow. I'm there. So 45 fucking days, bro, I'm in this son of a bitch. Just because I told him I didn't know nothing about the tobacco. So they hit me with a disobedient direct order and out of place of assignment. That's what I got charged with. You can't beat it. So I'm sitting there, and this attic van system that's going on, I'm hearing people constantly rap, scream, yell over these vents, bro. People are losing their mind. People couldn't handle it. I mean, it was fucking sad, man. So I'd get out of there two days before. Uh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry, I forgot the major part. After I got in that fight, right, I was on the laying roster to go home for Rockstar Department of Corrections. I did two and a half years in prison. That's only a 10-year sentence. You said, paroling out of ADC, Michael Dane Springer. I'm just like, man, I made it. But some just didn't feel right to me, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, you know, people are like, oh, you just fucking tripping, dude. You're going home. Chill the fuck out. Well, me and this other guy in the barracks were going home that day. And uh, they called Chow Call. So we lined up going to Chow. And as we're in line at Chow Call, they called dude out. He's going home. I'm like, what about me? Now nah, we'll get to you in a minute, Mr. Springer. So I go in there. I'm eating. You know, I can't even eat, man. I'm so nervous right now. What the hell's going on? Expecting the worst. So I hurry up, jump out of there. I stink in the line. I go see the IPO, internal parole officer. And I talk to him. He says, oh, Michael Springer. Lone Oak County called and said they have to pin charges on you. I said, what? This whole time I've been locked up? I'm thinking I'm coming out on a clean slate, brand new, doing the right thing. And you telling me I got possibly more time I got to do now? Because now it's not concurrent if I got more charges. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm tripping, bro. I'm tripping. He says, go back down to the barracks. We figured this out. We'll call you back down here. And I said, I'm down there waiting on... A test results is how I'm feeling right now. You know what I'm saying? It was fucking rough. About two or three hours go by, they call me back down there. He says, oh, Lono County called. They said they already prosecuted you on these charges. They just never turned your commitment papers into ADC. So you're not going home today. You got to go back up front of the pro board. And I was fucking drunk. So what that means is, translation, that once I got prosecuted, the prosecutors... After they dot every I, cross every T, they're supposed to send that form into ADC, and that's how my time gets commuted into the sentence. They never did that. They fell through the cracks. So, fast forward. I'm in the hole. It's the day before Christmas Eve. I get it. Some slide under the door. I open it up and I look at it, and it's a new time card. This new time card says, there's Lone Oak County finally on it. Now, when I came down to prison, I seen that Lone Oak County was on there, but I never questioned it because my first time down, I didn't know any better, but I know I was sent it, so I thought everything was going to be all right. Now I see Lone Oak County on there. Here's the kicker, though, Ian. They sent it to me five years. But you know what they gave me? They gave me five years on a fucking 70%, which is the controlling sentence, which means they would ate up that 10 years they did. 70% of my time, right? So... Now, I have another two and a half years to pull, bro, because now it's turned into a consecutive sentence. So you ended up doing about five years in prison. Well, I'm going to tell you what, how they saved me. Mm -hmm. I remember being in the barracks of prison and hearing all these people complain, but by the time they started like, they bought folks up. But, you know, meth changed the game in Arkansas as far as ratio, as far as people in prison. Time card came in the mail one day, and I get this time card in the mail, and it said... Uh, pretty much translation, there's too many white boys in prison right now for selling meth. It's getting overrun. As long as you're in good behavior and you're class one, you only have to do 50% of your time. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. I'm out of here. I'm out of here, man. You know, so I said I'd do two and a half more years. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, it was three and some change on the 70. So turned that concurrent sentence turned into consecutive sentences, two back-to-back 
and I did four and a half years the first time down. And I said to myself, I am going to do the speed limit, seat belts. I am following the law, and I am doing everything that I am not coming back to this motherfucker again. It didn't take me long in to realize once I got there that I don't belong here. Like, this place is not for me. I mean, I mean, I granted I was I deserved to be there, but, you know, there's some crazy people down there. You know, you're sleeping with somebody murderers and rapists. And did, you, did you end up sticking to that promise? No. Let me tell you how that worked out. But I will say, I got out. I got custody of my son, full custody, with child support, which is unheard of coming out of prison with 16 felonies, large habitual offender, right? Uh, I was enrolled in college. I had my own apartment. I got everything back that I'd lost. And um, I had a, you know, a strict script, and I stuck to it. Um, my problem was, was I got with this girl. And there's a repetitive cycle of that. And I ended up relapsing. As soon as I relapsed, it's like overnight, man. You know, my bank account's like uh, overdrawn. My, I lose my place. I dropped out of college. I'm, I mean, everything's going to shit. I pretty much lost my kid again, going back to the grandparents. And um, I go to prison again. Simultaneous the next time, got me with a, a rifle and a, some dope. And... Uh, I hired a uh, lawyer who used to be a judge. I think it was Willard Proctor. And um, he beat the simultaneous for me, but I still had to go down for the dope. So I did 17 months, 19, 17 to 19 months of prison on that one. Now, um, I'm with this new girl. I won't say new girl. I've known her since kindergarten, but we've been together. She was with me through um, two of my prison trips. And what's crazy, I spent more time in prison than pretty much in the relationship with her. But neither here nor there, um, I go to prison. And when I came out of prison the first time, I had lost everything. Everything was gone. You know, I learned a lot of valuable lessons on that. The second time I went to prison, um, I came out with everything I had, which speaks volumes to me. Like, a lot of people don't understand that. Like, if you could go to prison do some time and know when you come back that all your shit's going to be there and, and, you know, your money's going to be there and everything's good. That speaks volumes to me because Sarah went to Iraq and she went on a whole tour. They didn't cross the pond yet. You know what I'm saying? Lost everything. So anyway, I got with her and stayed with her on that. Got back and, you know, she was always on my ass. Quit selling dope. Quit doing that dope. But, you know, I just wasn't hearing none of that shit. You know what I'm saying? Um, I was, once I get high and get back into it, I'm stuck in it. You know what I'm saying? I felt like I was stuck in it. And once I said, like Albert Einstein said, you can't solve a problem the same way I said the problem began. And I stayed in it, stayed in it, go to prison again, do that time, I get out. And this time I'm not even faking the funk. I'm out the gate by eight and a spoon by noon, man, straight <laughs> up. You know what I'm mean? saying? And uh, so, I mean, I'm with the Mexicans now. I'm taking this ice and I'm using it as a red cook and making rice. And I was doing a bunch of crazy stuff and doing a lot of this, a lot of that. And it seems like, bro, you know, when I look back on it, for the times I got busted for the first time on up, every time I got busted, it was bigger and bigger and bigger every time I got in trouble. You know what I'm saying? So the last time I got busted, I was set up again. And I got busted with 197 grams of meth. And um, well, it's really not a lot in the grand scheme of things, but... I just dropped off a pound, and I was on my way to go re-up, and I had 197 grams left. I get set up, and uh, I go to jail that last time in Lono County, and uh, for me, that was the game changer. You know, um, my girl at the time would always bitch about me cooking dope, selling dope, Quit doing that, bring, bring it past you. Too much traffic, too much traffic. And I just, you know, wasn't hearing any of that shit. You know, I thought I was untouchable. And I always told her, if we get busted, I'm going to take it all. You don't have to worry about nothing. This is my operation. I will take all the trouble for it. You know what I'm saying? And I, I 100% was going to, it did that. But they came in. I'm going to tell you what happened. I just cooked a batch of dope at my house the night before. Once I got pulled over, I seen the whole play happen out. This cop was waiting on me. And soon before I even passed him, he turned his blue lights on. 
I was going to say I was so dope with this person at Dollar General right there. They're watching me the whole time. They're calling me, texting me, saying, hey, police is here. Be careful. So as soon as I pull in, I call her. I said, listen, I got pulled over. It's done. I'm busted. She hung up on me because she was busy at work. I called her back. Bitch, don't hang up this phone again. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you right now, it's a wrap. They got me. She said, what do you mean? I said, I just got busted. They're pulling me over. She hung up the phone. She walks out of her job, hauls ass to the house, goes in the house, cleans the entire house out, get the meth lab out, get everything out, takes it to her brother's house that lives right down the road from where we was living, and drops it off. So I had crossed everything as far as I have a search waiver on file. They could search me any time, any place. So nothing was in my name. That was her house, not my house, right? They didn't bust me at the house. You know what I'm saying? So they went back to the house, and she was there. And they said, uh, hi, we're detective, da 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 We just busted Michael Spring with a, a large, substantial amount of methamphetamines. We have reason to believe there's more meth in the house. Can we come in? She said, yeah, go get a search warrant. And that's what I always told her to do. She got fu- They got fucking pissed, bro. Pissed. So I'm sitting at the Lono County Jail not knowing any of this. I'm believing all this. And um, I got busted with another dude who was in the car with me. I told him, bro, it's, I, I got this. You know, I'm all, you ain't got to worry about this. You were just wrong, up, wrong place, wrong time, da-da-da. So <clears throat> they had to wait till this happened early in the morning. They had to go all the way to Carlisle to get a judge to sign off on this about 6 o'clock at night before they finally got to come over. Of course, they stayed there and made her stay outside the whole time. And they went in, searched the house, and they found some shit. You know, you're living in a trap house, so you're not going to get everything at one time. They found some dope, found some other shit, and they took her kid from her. And that, for me, bro, was um, the ultimate that the eye opener for me. She was a good mom. You know what I'm saying? She did try to warn me. She did try to get me to stop doing that shit. <clears throat> so when I seen her come into jail, I thought, dude, I was like, oh, my gosh. They arrested her. DHS took the kid. And um, they tried to get me for drug trafficking, bro, which is, you know, state of Arkansas, you have to have 200 grams or more to be a drug trafficker. I had 197, <laughs> beat him by three fucking grams. Mm-hmm. So that way the sense of grid changes at that point. It goes, you know, it's more than 10 grams, less than 200. It's an entirely different sentencing order. And uh, anyway, uh she gets out there, she gets able to bond out. And when I finally bond out, later on down the road, uh, I get out of jail. And I'm like, the end of the point of my life was like, I didn't give a fuck about me, bro. You know what I'm saying? I didn't care about what happened to me. I didn't care whether I lived or died at this point. I was just, bro, you know, at that point in time, just kill me, do me a favor. At that point, I was. Walking in place. Sometimes I was walking backwards. That's how bad it was. You know, it was crazy. Um, DHS, you know, I hear people, I'll call them normies. I know that's probably stigmatizing language. People have never been to in addiction. They'll say, how can this mother not get her child back? Do what she has to do to get her child back? And for the first time in life, I was able to see the hoops you have to jump through to get your kid back, someone who's just fresh out of addiction, it's rough. I mean, it's rough. And if you don't do one of the things they say, bro, you're done. You know what I'm saying? They make it even harder for you. So I I don't say it's right, but I get it. I see it. I understand it. And um, she had to go to rehab for 30 days. Now, we still had a court case going on, right? So the, the court ordered her to go to the rehab. I took her to rehab fighting the whole way. Didn't want to do it. So she goes there. I drive the profile. We have a court date. I go to court and I tell the prosecutor. I said, hey, she's in rehab right now. We got ordered to go. She's not going to be here today because she's in rehab. And they're like, oh, great. Good. We're just glad to see she's in there. That's good. She'll have some documentation. Da, da, da. I said, yeah, she has all that. So we go to court. They set it off. Da, da, da. So I'm still getting high. I'm still doing the things I'm doing. Uh, I'm telling you this, I got worse, man. The day she got out of rehab, I went and picked her up. And I know that she would have followed me back into that fire. 30 days ain't enough time for shit, bro. You know what I'm saying? So that day I picked her up. My house, old house is right here. Her brother's house lived right here at the corner. I'm driving through Cabot in my car. 
and I pull up in her brother's house, and I had my buddy pull up behind me, kind of blocking my car, and the drug task force from Cabot saw me, recognized my car, and they just followed me in there, and they just swooped in like knights of shining armor and Pearl Harbored my ass, <laughs> and I didn't see him coming. I was like, oh, my gosh, I got canines. I got everybody here. I'm like, oh, fuck, you know what I'm saying? And So that was God, man, because God knew I would have taken her back into that fire. You know what I'm saying? And I got busted right there. Thank God they didn't search the car, but they took me into custody. Because this is what's crazy. The state of Arkansas changed this deal, and I've already did a parole violation before. You get in trouble, you're guaranteed. You're going to go to the front of this kangaroo court parole thing, and then you're getting found guilty, and you're going back six months, which translates to nine months before you get out. Um, That's how it was last time I went. Well, they told me, Hey, man, if you just turn yourself in, bro, you'll do a sanction, seven-day sanction, you'll be out. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> not falling for that shit, bro. I'm not. I'm way too high to believe something like that. Yeah. So I didn't go in. So then that's when they put the warrant out for my arrest. So that first it was three days, then it was going to be a seven-day, then it turned into 90 days. So I had a warrant out for me. They knew it. They followed me over there. They got me, locked me up. I'm in jail. I'm sitting there. I'm here. I'm clean again. I don't have to come off this. I've been on a bender, bro. I've been on one hard. I'm sleeping. I'm rough. And uh, 90 days comes up. I worked my way all the way up to trustee out there in the shop. And uh, anyway, so I'm sitting in jail. I'm going to tell you this funny story, man. This is real shit, but this is kind of crazy. This guy named Chief McCoy, who was the chief deputy there at Lono County, uh, I just held up to him, not directly, but through somebody else. You know, it was their hustle. I give him some dope. He'd get a teener, then he would take the gram down there, sell it to her full price to pay for his teener and some dope, and he would get high. She would get high with him, All right? So now I'm a trustee in the shop, which is as high as you can go, bro. It's like mafia style living at Lone Oak County Jail. If you're a T3, you got your own shower. You got microwave, you got big screen TVs, you got DVDs, you got your own phone in there. I mean, real mattresses, real pillows, everything. Food, steaks brought up to me. Bro, it was nice. There wasn't nothing I was going to do to lose that. You know what I'm saying? So he come out the head of the thesis pediment. He talked like this. <laughs> he said, Springer, Springer, Springer. I'll never forget it. Springer. He said, I know you. I know who you'll be hanging out with. And I was like, yeah. He said, Eddie, Eddie Butler. You hanging out with Eddie Butler. That's the guy I was in combat with, who set me up, by the way. Um, so anyway, I'm sitting there, and uh, he said, yeah, he do a lot of myth, don't he? He was feeling me out, fishing me out, bro, and I just played dumb. I said, man, he don't do that shit no more, man, you know, even though he does and still does. But um, I didn't bite. So he was really trying to see where I was at because, you know, I really believe he'd got my punk ass out of there. So uh, we go back. I knew what the business was going on the whole time. I get out. I do my 90 days. I was supposed to go to court. This is what they did me a solid favor. Um, they came up and said, hey, we're going to let you out. We'll let you get your affairs in order. You fix to go to prison. You know it. Go get your affairs in order and come back. And I was like, I didn't want to leave, bro, because I was scared. Because I had just got clean, and I had really made my mind up at this time. I hit my knees in that Lone Oak County Jail. And I said to God, I said, God, I don't I can't do this anymore. I don't know. I can't control this. I, I can't do this. And I says, Whatever I need to do, let me do just do it. And then, however you can use me, use me. I'll do whatever I need to do. And I said that. So when it came time for them to tell me I need to get out, I was scared to get out because I didn't know what was gonna happen when I got out there. So I ended up going and I asked the sheriff, I said, Sheriff. Please let me come back out to T3 when I go to prison because you don't want to start back up and ground level and then work your way up. And so he never would give me an answer. You know, that's how it goes. But anyway, I do my time. Well, that time got extended, right? So then it went from two weeks before I go to prison and then it shot out to like six months. Didn't get high. Didn't entertain it. Didn't think about it. And this was the first time of all my prison times in that I actually um, 
most of the times I get locked up and never get to go out. And I'm just I'm sit there and go to prison. This is the first time I was actually be able to on the outside, knowing I'm going to prison, and trying to stay positive. You know, I had a you know a, a trauma as a kid. I was able to block things out, but you can only block that out so much because you knew that you were fixing to go do some time. Very depressing. Very very hard to. It was just very hard for me, but I go in, turn myself in, go to court. I got in. I look like I'm walking like this because I got so many whites on. I got six pairs of socks, four or five pairs of drawers <laughs> on, three long johns and thermals, and I didn't do the business. You know what I'm saying? So I go in there. They put me in intake out there in the intake cell. You know where we did a the cook off. There's a one little cell that was on the outside where we did that cook off. That's where you come in when you first get in. Mm-hmm. I was out there for about 15 minutes. And one of the guards came out there. I said, Springer, get your shit. I said, where are you going? He said, you know where you're going, man. Put me right back at the 2-3. I said, hell yeah, here we go. So I'm in 2-3. I do my time. I see uh, I see Mr. Steve McCoy, right? <laughs> and I'm watching him. And this is I don't know if you know anything about the meth world or what that does, but usually people get on dope and they start <laughs> Drawing that face in, they'll yeah. start compensating for that and start growing thicker beards out to make it look like their cheeks are full. Mm-hmm. Oh, classic. I can see it a mile away. That's what he was doing. You know what I'm saying? Look like it started to look like a cancer patient. And they start growing that beard out. You know what I'm saying? Well, anyway, I go to prison, do my time, right? And uh, I, I became, you know, pretty close with everyone at the sheriff's office, administration side. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I go to prison. I'm down there. I'm working horse barn this time. I'm at Dermot Prison, which is in the Dirty Delta, uh, way down by Louisiana, Mississippi, down there. And um, it sucked, by the way. Um, Sitting there, and a guard came in who was a guard. Now he's transporting. He's ranked, moved up. And he's transporting these guys back and forth to court. He happened to be coming through Dermot while I was sitting down there on this horse. And uh, he says, Springer. I was like, what's up, man? We get to talking. You know, we're chopping it up. And he tells me they started this new program at Lone Oak County called the PAC program. And I first thought was like, these motherfuckers wait till I go to prison to start this. You know what I'm saying? But uh, anyway, I was like, he said, man, you need to get involved when you get out, bro. That's what you need to do. I got to think it on that, man. And I was like, man, that's what I want to do when I get out of here. But I had no idea what that was going to look like. So uh, I do the rest of my time. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do. And I know I've come to the realization in it by this time. Like I told you, the sober experience for me was to know that I went over there and fought for freedom come back and strip my own freedom away. So I came back and I got out of the prison and went straight into the VA. When I went straight to the VA, it was um, it was for this. You know, say I can stay clean, but when those triggers come up, anniversaries, dates, and things of that, I usually I've done enough now to know that I'm gonna go back. I get high. I need to get this fixed. So I'd been to the VA several times, but never took it serious. And this time I got serious with it, and I laid it all out there. I got trans. I mean, I'm transparent, bro. Put it on the table. Cried like a little five year old baby, and let it out. It was the biggest relief I've ever felt in my life. And um, I had to do this training. Well, this, it was an inpatient in PTSD, very intensive. And I had to do this, tra- uh, I don't know what you call it, the CBT <laughs> crap or whatever it was. But it worked. And I would sit in this room with this guy who's probably 21, 22 years old. And it, you know, kind of looked like you, baby face, you know what <laughs> I'm saying? Never been to war. Never probably never even served. He was a social worker, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I had to sit in a chair, and I had to tell that whole story, that combat story, that first firefight I got into, from start to finish. And I thought, any time I used to think about this, I had to run and go get high. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And now you want me to replay from the way I started it to the last thing I saw over and over and over, and had to record it. I had to go back to my room at night and listen to it, and listen to it, 
and listen to it and come back in his office and do that. And I thought, man, I was so fucking mad, bro. I was ready to kick a puppy. I love puppies. You know what I'm saying? This shit was driving me crazy. But the theory is, was that if you were a kid and you watched a scary movie and you watched it over and over and over again, it was no longer scary. And I started thinking of it like that. It made a lot of fucking sense to me. When I was stopped from the thought of thinking about that, the more I told the story, the more I took power over that. The more I started taking control back over that. It did not control me. It did not make me want to go out and get high. So that that saved my life. That was one of the best things that saved my life right there. Was I was able, because I told you, I was never a Dr. Philly type dude. I was never uh, expressing my feelings well from childhood up. It bled into my adult life. Um, I had trouble processing shit, man. So when I went to prison, I learned a lot. Prison taught me a lot, man. It really taught me. I say I grew up in Iraq, but prison taught me how to be a man. And I mean that by respect and boundaries and, you know, things of that nature. Um, But I get out the VA, and I'm with this girl. And I told her, I said, look, man, if you just stay clean. She stayed clean, got her daughter back, so everything's back to normal again. I'm telling her, stay clean, I'm going to be here, you know. And uh, she started drinking. And, of course, she's her dad come from a long line of alcoholics. She started drinking. So now I try to justify my mind. Okay, well, she's drinking and she's not doing meth. That's okay. I can deal with that. You know what I mean? I don't drink, never have. Um, so I'm putting up with that. Um, now I'm at this point uh, where I'm back at home again. I have no job. I'm service-connected. I have 26 felonies. Walmart's saying, I'll put your application on file. We'll call you if, you know, we need you. That's the kind of shit I was dealing with in Arkansas, you know. But um, I'm going to the VA. Well, the VA finally come to me and pursued me and said, hey, you, we think you need to be ready at the 100% ready. The VA came at me with this, which was odd. So I got my 100% unemployable. So I'm blessed. I'm truly thankful that I was able to get that. Because uh, I have 26 fellas, has been in prison three times, bro. There's not much out there for me. You know, so there is. Don't get me wrong. There is. But anyway, it solved that problem for me finances. Um, now I'm at home, though, and I'm scared of getting stuck back into that old motion because that's what I was in. I didn't work. I didn't do anything. I stayed at home, bro. Idle times, devil's playground. We all know that. So um, Michael Brooks. He's a buddy of mine I spent in combat with, served in combat with. He has started an organization in Arkansas called We Are the 22. It's a veteran suicide organization. And um, he went to Iraq. He did two another tour after we did. We came back. And while he was there, he got hit with an IED. And when he got hit with that IED, I mean, TBI, you know, threat shrapnel going up and down his legs and body. They shipped him to Fort Sam in Texas. And while he's down in Texas, they pumped his body full of, um, you know, opiates, had him fully addicted to opiates, medically retired him out of the military, which depressed him because he was wanting to be a, a retire as a soldier. You know, it was his life, kind of like I was. And um, sent him back to Arkansas. When he sent him back to Arkansas, they take him off the opiates. Well, what do you think he's going to do then? That's going to turn straight to illicit street drugs. So he went down a dark path as well. And it's like I said, everyone come back from this war fucked up some way. And um, he found himself in an abandoned home in Baltimore, Arkansas, in rural, rural part, shooting a shot of heroin, trying to kill himself. It was freezing cold. He said he woke up off that floor and was in the VA. When he went to the VA, he was there. And it was an eye-opening experience for him. He saw a lot of people talking the talk, wasn't really nobody walking the walk as far as veteran suicide. So we started this organization called We Are the 22. If there's a veteran struggling in a crisis, any time of the day, any time of the night, holidays, weekends, rain, snow, sleet, or hail, you call. We're going to activate a two-man team, and we're going to go directly to that veteran and talk about that crisis. We have an MOU with the VA in Little Rock. We will take that veteran straight there and get him into a program. So I believe that anybody who's been through addiction, anybody who's been in the trenches, on the other side of that, you're going to be filled with compassion and empathy for those in the struggle. I believe that 100%. Um, 
um, some of the most beautiful souls coming out of the darkest holes. All right. So everyone's calling me and saying, hey, man, you need to get in this We Are 22. You need to do something. I didn't have a mission and purpose, and that was my problem. And I think a lot of people in their recovery process don't have that mission or purpose. When you don't have a mission or purpose, you're just spinning, going at nowhere. You know, I went to Iraq. I did all these great things. And I come home, and I just pissed my life away uh, in prison and drugs. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't doing Kenneth Melton any favors, the guy who took my spot and died. So, and I had all this going on me. So I call him Michael, and I'm, I'm talking to these people, and I have random people calling me I served in Iraq with, and they're just trying to fill me out over the phone to see where I'm at. Because let's look, let's be honest. Habitually speaking, statistically speaking, I get out of prison, I do good for a while, and then I'm back at it. Why would anyone want to give me the opportunity? I can't blame nobody. Mm-hmm. So finally, two people called me, and then Michael Brooks called me. And I didn't know this until about a year ago when Michael Brooks came to my house and celebrated my five years clean, or four years, whatever it was, is that he heard the hunger in my voice, and he knew that I was ready. And um, I, I truly to this day believe he saved my life because he gave me that voice back. He gave me that mission of purpose that, that addiction had stole from me and told me that I was worthless and I'll never amount to anything and that I'm everything I touch turns to shit. You know, just all those negative feelings addiction comes with. He was able to put me, give me my voice back. So fast forward. I'm going to the sheriff's office. In the meantime, every time I got out of prison, my goal was to be a peer recovery specialist. I wanted to do what that job was. I felt like that's what I need to do. I, I would be great. Every time I go there, that Chief McCoy stops me. Every time I get to spring up, spring up, spring up. <laughs> Seraph ain't here right now. Spring up, but I tell him you call. And come up here. So I would leave. About the third time of that, bro, I just like. Well, God, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? If this is not what you want me to do, just let me know. And I'll stop coming up here. You know what I'm saying? It's, every time I come up here, I'm getting shut doors every time. So I get back, start doing this We Are 22. So now I'm devoting all my time to this We Are 22 deal. I go on 16 responses my first year, bro. I was a fucking animal. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I want to be there to help everybody I can. So I got named Responder of the Month, and they— took his picture of me, did a bio, and just did this badass fucking social media post, you know what I'm saying, and posted all over social media. Well, I guess Sheriff Staley saw it. And when Sheriff Staley saw it, um, I get a call from him on Messenger. And I'm like, prank call, prank call, what the hell is <laughs> Sheriff calling me for, you know what I'm saying? I was freaked out. So I answered it, and I'm talking to him, and he's like, Michael. I was like, what's up? And he says, let's have lunch. I said, all right, when? He said, well, how fast can you get here? I said, well, as fast as the law allows, I'll be there. So now I'm driving up to the sheriff's office. Now I'm thinking in my mind, because we work for law enforcement, we are 22, better in crisis, they'll call us, and we'll go help them out. That's what he wants to team up and do with, right? So I'm getting my presentation all together, going to talk about we are 22 and everything that's going on. I got everything in my head. I go up there and. I sit down and I start talking to him. Bam. Tell him about this. We are 22. He goes, that's, pretty, that's good, man. Listen. Uh, that's not what I want to talk to you about. He was like, you were one of the biggest meth dealers in Lono County. They're going to listen to you before they listen to me. I want you to come help us run this PAC program. And I was like, that's God opening doors no man can close right there. And I said, absolutely. Sign me up, coach. Let's do this. That's awesome. And that was I, phew, one of the greatest accomplishments right there because I've been working on this, man. And I'll tell you, when I was at the VA, I was there at the New Year, and and I had sat down and wrote a lot of goals I wanted, easy, attainable goals I wanted to do, right? And uh, I kept up with it that whole year. And I found out the things I kept checking off, more doors started opening up, more goals started opening You know, and it goes... And I think, damn, that changed my life on that. My goal was to be a peer specialist, and how it happened, you know, I started doing what was right, and those doors started open to make it happen. And I believe God was putting me through all this to prepare me for this chapter. 